Okay, bonjour à, à toutes et tous. Hello, everybody. Hello, Stephen. Okay. J'espère que vous avez euh, passé une bonne, euh, une bonne nuit de sommeil, que vous avez bien métabolisé cette euh, première journée. Alors, c'est vrai que se retrouver à 8h30 un samedi, c'est un effort. Euh, mais peut-être la bonne chose, c'est qu'on n'avait pas affronté les routes glissantes euh, ou les transports publics euh, bondés pour cette, cette journée. Donc, euh, aujourd'hui, on va, on va poursuivre le, le programme hein, comme, euh, comme prévu. On, on aura le plaisir d'avoir Steven avec nous euh, durant la matinée jusqu'à jusqu midi. Et cet après-midi, on repassera en, en mode euh, plus atelier, comme, euh, comme on l'a fait hier. Et puis, ça nous permettra d'aborder plus les les dimensions euh, pédagogie de la pratique et pratique épistémique, ce qui sont un peu les, les, euh, les deux gros chapitres de la matinée, et puis l'après-midi sur la question de, de l'intégration et de, de la problématique de, de l'alternance en, en formation. Euh, Peut-être juste euh, une ou deux annonces au plan technique. Donc, comme disait euh, Isabelle, j'ai déposé sur... Euh, sur Moodle, l'enregistrement de la session d'hier. Donc, vous pourrez la, la trouver euh, au moyen du lien Dropbox euh, ici. Euh, par contre, ce qui est important, c'est que euh, vous puissiez bien, euh, non seulement, je vais juste vous montrer, euh, non seulement euh, visualiser, si ça vous intéresse, la vidéo depuis le, le browser, mais si vous la regardez comme ça, elle va être bloquée à, à jusqu'à 60 minutes, au fait. Donc, ce qu'il faut faire, c'est euh, télécharger euh, localement le fichier sur votre ordinateur, au, moins du bout, au moyen du bouton télécharger. Et là, vous aurez les quatre heures d'enregistrement qui vont être disponibles. OK Donc, si ça vous intéresse de le, de le regarder, c'est important bien de télécharger le, le fichier sur... Euh, sur votre ordinateur. Je précise aussi que c'est que les sessions plénières qui ont été enregistrées, mais pas les, euh, les travaux de sous-groupe. On ne peut pas enregistrer euh, cinq groupes en parallèle avec, euh, avec l'outil Zoom. Et puis euh, également, deuxième annonce, c'est que dans les, le diaporama des exposés, euh, Steven m'a envoyé une version actualisée du, du PowerPoint qu'il présentera ce matin. Donc, elle figure là dans, dans Geneva Day 2 Handout version 2. Donc, il y a quelques petits changements. Si vous avez imprimé les, les documents, euh, il y aura peut-être une ou deux euh, modifications par rapport à, à ce que vous aviez euh, dans le document qui était mis à disposition antérieurement. OK. Est-ce que vous avez des, des commentaires ou des, des demandes sur le plan logistique ou pratique Non OK. So, we'll now uh, switch... Uh, into English and uh, welcome Stephen again and, and thank him for being with us on a Saturday. He should be uh, enjoying a Saturday evening and he's spending uh, his time with us. So thank you very much. We're very grateful for that. Um, I have to apologize for um, Ayla Bimonte. Uh, she's not here this morning because she is involved in another uh, seminar taking place exactly on the same dates. And so she will be with us this afternoon, uh, but she was uh, asked to contribute to this other seminar in the parallel. Um, so, okay, Stephen, as I told you, we saw we, we had a busy day uh, yesterday. The students were very uh, engaged in uh, activity one on uh, workplace learning concepts and uh, curriculum concepts, activity two. Um, it was very uh, intense uh, group work. Um, I thought maybe I could just, um, give you some, um, some examples of the work situations that were worked by students. Uh, it's, it will not be exhaustive, but it will just give you um, a glance at the variety of situations we discussed or students discussed in groups. So there were some uh, students working in the context of uh, medical care, so nursing in intensive care. So this was an example that was discussed in one of the groups. Um, we also had a situation of uh, substitute teachers at secondary education. Uh, physiotherapy, 
so also uh, health, the health sector. Um, we had the language teaching courses for um, non-francophone students, so foreign um, French as a second language teaching and learning. Uh, we had also examples from um, people working in um, um, we call that uh, we call that uh, Ed de video. Do you have the English term, a constance about Ed de in English? How would you call that? I don't have the English term. Um, maybe so in um, life uh, aid. No, no, life aid is something that rescues people on the beach. Every but, day, um, everyday assistance. I mean, people. Uh, yeah. People uh, assisting uh, elderly people in their own uh, uh, yeah. homes. Home care. It's not. Yeah, uh, it's not. It's not only elderly people. It's a mix between education yeah. and um, care. So they also assist um, people working at the kindergarten or nurseries, or but they can also work in senior residences. So it's called auxiliary vime, life auxiliary. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that maybe. So it's a it's a people bringing their uh, bringing kind of um, help in different contexts. It might be um, elderly care or early childhood and or different contexts. Mm -hmm. And then we had examples from. Um, medical uh, simulation, training through simulation. Uh, we also had some um, um, trainers or people responsible for training programs that had to go digital. Uh, I mean, um, performing a digital transition in the field of uh, uh, workplace training. Uh, we had people uh, working as a night night guards in um, toxicodependent uh, centers. Toxicodependent people are that addicted to drugs. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. people um, that um, work in these institutions as uh, night guards. Yeah. Um, we had examples from accountancy, uh, so uh, services and um, also tutoring uh, in school for school children, uh, helping helping children to do their homework or to perform in, in school. And also we had some examples from um, students having internships in their uh, university programs in all, all sorts of different contexts. So it's not exhaustive, but it gives you a bit of a range of, uh, of situations. Yeah, um, we also had some... Uh, Examples of student work, like uh, working in a bakery as a salesperson, uh, so shop working in shops as a as a student uh, yeah. or student work. And so, uh, based on this uh, situation, students discussed uh, both uh, workplace learning uh, concepts for activity one and also curriculum concepts for activity two. And so what I asked the students to do for yesterday uh, afternoon activity was to maybe uh, tease out some of the questions that could be uh, raised uh, based on their work. And so we, we might now have a session where we can uh, hear these questions and maybe you can bring some answers. Sure, yeah, good, thank you. Okay, so... Um, Students, it's it's your turn now. If uh, if you can maybe um, try to uh, to come back with the questions that you raised yesterday. I mean, we we discussed uh, the workplace learning concepts together, so you, uh, some of the questions were raised at that time, but also the curriculum concepts. You you were supposed to identify uh, questions, so I I now invite you to um, to ask them. Yes, we we had in our group uh, a question that was raised about the workplace, um, and it was about how do you um, define now the workplace since most of us are uh, home or working from home, and so the 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 environment changed. Your workplace is the same where you live, and how do you yeah. how do you apprehend the this yeah, that's a good. I mean, it's a good question. Sometimes 
I think it's helpful to refer to work practice rather than workplace. So for instance, taxi drivers, um, you know, their, you know, their work practice is across Geneva. They might, you know, drive in a cab, but their work practice, and there's lots of workers whose work is not fixed in a workplace. So sometimes I think it's helpful to um, think of it in terms of a work practice rather than a workplace, uh, because, you know, certain people move around in their work, like taxi drivers, transport people, builders. Um, but as you're saying, now work is increasingly being done in situations like this. So that's why I think it's helpful, not necessarily to relate it just to a work, physical workplace, but also a, you know, a work practice, which can um, include arrangements like, like this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's helpful. But it takes you back from um, being constrained by um, not only the time that you're in a physical um, a physical workplace, but also the kind of issues that you consider when you're not in that workplace, yeah. um, such as when you're thinking through cases. Um, Doctors, for instance, talk about doing that a lot. I know as an academic, I often, when I'm working on an idea, I'm in the garden pulling out weeds or something um, as a way of distracting myself or whatever. So, yeah, is that helpful, Matteo? Yeah, to think I, about I, think, I, I think maybe, uh, and if I'm wrong, Leah will, will add up. It's um, opposing to like, a, as opposed to a taxi driver who works in his taxi and and drove, drives everywhere around Geneva. Uh, we now work in the same place we live in. It's to make the difference between when we, you're working and when you're just at home, not working. Yeah. And this difference yeah. between uh, these, it's the same place, but it's a different type yeah. of. Uh, yeah. You don't live in the same place. Engagements. Way. Yeah, yeah, it's a different type of engagement. Thanks. Yeah. Now, I think it's a good point. And I mean, one issue people talk about is now is where does work, where does work life finish? Um, I was talking to some young people who are having to work from home in a very small apartment. And what one of them does is in the morning, he gets up, he has his breakfast and he actually puts on a collared shirt. And he goes for a walk around the suburb and then comes back to where he lives with his partner and commences his work. And then at the end of the day, he finishes and he just goes for a walk around. And in some sense that for him, that works in terms of making that, that break. Um, so yeah, so that's an instance of, um, of, of, of where that happens. But of course, there's lots of workers who find themselves on call. Uh, a lot of health workers, you know, they're, you know, they're waiting for this to go off. Um, firefighters, they're often on call. They're waiting in the, in the fire station. I don't know what you call it in, um, in French. And they're waiting and waiting and maybe they're training and then all of a sudden the alarm goes off and then they have to get in the fire engine and go and um, fight fires. But mainly firefighters don't fight fires anymore they get people out of wrecked cars. But I mean, they, they go from one mode of work to another mode of work very quickly when once the alarm goes off. Yeah, maybe if I, I can, John, add, add to the discussion. Um, I yeah. think what, what is also uh, interesting to consider with uh, working from home is um, uh, how it may also impact uh, engagement and affordances, I mean, referring back to uh, concepts of workplace learning, because we, this is something that is very much discussed now in, um, in Switzerland, I'm sure it's also discussed in, um, in other countries is, uh, for instance, um, when people are working from home, how can we uh, make sure they are, they are really working? How does the organization uh, exert a control on their level of engagement? 
And also we, we might think that uh, it might also uh, have an influence on the sorts of uh, affordances available or not to the workers. For instance, if you are away from your colleagues, you might not have opportunities to learn from observing them or from informal discussions in the coffee room. Yes. So I yeah. think it's also interesting to see how this change of context also might exert an influence on the conditions in which learning may occur or not. Well, on the contrary, maybe people may be more engaged because they are not spending hours in the traffic uh, or they, they might have also less stress because they are in their familiar environment. So it, it might also have a kind of positive impact on their, on their engagement or, I don't know. This was also the kind yeah. of discussions we might yeah. uh, have on that topic. Certainly, I think it's changed. Now, I'll give you some examples. As I mentioned yesterday, I've currently got a study which is looking at how doctors, doctors' practices, medical doctors' practices in rural communities have been affected by coronavirus and doing a lot of, um, of consultations using the phone. And one of the ideas behind telehealth which was to use Zoom or whatever to engage with patients is that what's happened is most patients are more comfortable using a mobile telephone. And the doctors are telling me that they're now changing their practice because previously when a patient came into this, into their consulting room, they would spend some time looking at them and saying, how are you? How's life going? and there would be a social interaction. And then slowly they would turn to the computer where they'd have all of the information about the patient and they'd be listening to the patient and engaging with the computer while listening to the patient. Now they're telling me that something else happens because they don't need to do all the face-to-face -face contact um, and that they have the patient on the telephone and they're working straight from the computer looking at so while they've got the patient here speaking on the telephone, they're immediately looking at the screen. And so the actual work, intera it, it, the, the work interaction has actually changed. Um, they say generally, the ones we've interviewed so far have said that it's far more efficient and they're able to um, engage with patients far more quickly um, and decide whether the patient needs to come in for a face-to-face -face consultation or whether they can do things um, at a distance. And of course, this is particularly important in rural communities where a patient might have to, have to drive for maybe an hour or two hours um, into the town to see the doctor, wait for the doctor, then drive back again. So for the doctor, it's big changes. For the patients, it, it's changed. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's necessarily a question of, um, just a question of whether it's, um, it's good or bad, but the fact that things are changing. And part of this project is to see what works well. And after the pandemic, hopefully there will be an after pandemic, um, um, how things might change to make the work of doctors and also receptionists and practice managers and practice nurses um, different um, as a result of using um, this, this technology. You know, so, so I think it's, it's about a change of practice um, as much as saying there are good and bad things about it. One thing has come out of that study, by the way, is uh, the, we're also interviewing people who are called registrars. And in Australia, that is people who are, who are qualified doctors and they're learning their specialism, which is to be a general practitioner. And we're also interviewing medical students who are spending time in the general practice. And both of them are saying that it's in some ways, it's not such a good learning experience for the reasons that Laurent was saying. And that is they don't get the face-to-face -face interaction with the patients. But what they're also saying is that uh, they have the ability now to use their time in a different way to engage with patients' medical records and then contact them with follow-up interviews in ways which are um, efficient and effective from their perspective. So there's changes going on. Thank you. 
any other questions or comments on that topic or on any other topics? J'ai juste yeah. une question de traduction. Oui. <laughs> Je suis désolé, j'ai perdu le fil, mais euh, je n'ai pas bien compris l'exemple qu'il a donné sur les médecins experts et sur les étudiants. Euh, vous arrivez juste à me retraduire ça en français Quelqu'un veut se lancer dans la traduction Je suis désolé. Euh, moi, je veux bien essayer. Est-ce que tu, tu parles du coup des, de, de changement de pratique des médecins, c'est ça Exactement. Okay. Euh, alors, en gros, l'idée, c'est que euh, les médecins, ils ont passé euh, pendant le coronavirus, enfin, on est toujours en plein dedans, mais ils ont passé une partie de leur euh, consultation par euh, moyen téléphonique ou par euh, ordinateur. Et qu'en fait, c'est plus pratique pour eux d'utiliser le téléphone parce que finalement, ils n'ont pas besoin de parler à la personne puis revenir sur l'ordinateur pour avoir les informations puis revenir au patient. Grosso modo, c'est ça. Euh, tu as besoin de toute l'explication La fin, c'était la fin, c'était sur ta, la, ta question, c'était sur la fin. Antoine Antoine, on ne vous entend plus. Le... <rire> Pardon. Euh, c'est juste sur l'exemple qu'il a donné sur les experts et les étudiants. J'ai juste pas compris. Le, en fait, il, il, explique... non, il expliquait que c'était les étudiants, qui... enfin, les des médecins qui sont déjà diplômés de médecine, mais qui sont en train de faire leur spécialisation. Et puis, il y avait encore des études. Et donc, qui sera être médecin généraliste, de ce que j'ai compris. Et puis, il y a les étudiants en médecine qui sont, déjà, qui sont en train de faire de la médecine générale dans leur cursus d'étudiants, qui disaient que l'expérience n'était pas très positive de leur point de vue. Okay, si j'ai bien beaucoup. compris. Je pense que c'est oui. ça. Oui. Merci beaucoup pour les traductions. So, Stephen, we had some translation going on. Yeah. yeah. The students translated what some others. Uh, did not quite understand. Merci, merci, thank you. Okay, any other questions that... Uh, yeah, we had, um, Lawrence? yeah, we had a question in our group. So um, one of my colleagues um, had to face a crisis situation where she had to uh, overnight digitalize all her courses, her classes. So it's a situation of stress and um, it's on this, um, the health situation uh, that um, where she, uh, she needed to um, digitalize all our classes. And we were wondering, how can you define a curriculum, a learning curriculum um, in unforeseen situations where people have to, um, uh, yeah, uh, are faced with uh, crisis, stress, uh, crisis situation stress, and uh, all these unforeseen situations, how can you define the curriculum inside these situations? Yeah, well, I think it's a very good question. Um, what I think you do is you look at what happened and see what is effective. And that was a question, by the way, that we asked in these general uh, practice situations. And we said, because what, ha what happened in these doctor's surgeries is they had to change things virtually within a day or so. They had to change their entire practice. Um, and I asked one of the doctors about, sorry, the doctor was asked, um, well, I, I said, you know, what, what planning would you put in place if you had to do it all again? And he said, if we went through planning, um, it would take months and it would be a mess. Um, what we had to do was react very quickly to something. And it's, it's probably best to look at what happened. Um, and his comment was that um, everything was new um, and they just had to do, they had to, they had to do what they had to do at that point in time. But I think that's one of those situations where you look back at it and say, once you've done it, which is what we're doing in this project, what could be improved um, and how could that process be better? So in some sense, what you're referring to, this activity, which by the way, this activity has gone across um, many, many countries in, in uh, school education and tertiary education. 
Um, and I think it's a question of looking at it and saying, what can we learn from that and how can it be improved? And, you know, how can we make that a better experience? So I think that's the curriculum development process that, um, that, that comes um, from that. That's why, by the way, the, um, a lot of this, the stuff I'll be referring to today comes from anthropology, which looks at the way in which cultural practices um, are learned and transformed and, and, and what goes on. And we, we can look at, those, look at those situations and learn from them. And I think that's where you generate uh, the curriculum from. Because it's from practice, and so practice is constantly changing, and then you make sense of it. And I think I think you try and respond to it. But that, I think that's one way of answering the question, uh, Lawrence. Okay, thank you. And maybe just to, uh, to 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 move on that same topic, um, I have the feeling that um, curriculum concepts. I mean, based on this anthropology. Um, the work of anthropologists that you you uh, you referred to is is very much based on practices that are quite uh, stable across time. They are heritages from history, so I think they are all this this uh, sequencing of activities. When we think about tailors or pottery, this is something that is really established in the long term for a, a kind of uh, sedimentation of historical practices. Um, and uh, if we think now about the situation we were discussing in that same group about this um, trainer that, ha that has to, to face unforeseen rapid and, and radical changes and quickly adapt and completely change uh, her work habits, um, how do curriculum concepts apply to this yeah. Uh, yeah. rapid and radical revolution of work? Uh, is it still uh, relevant to think in terms of curriculum, or is this are we in a completely different paradigm that is not uh, really uh, designed or adapted to this kind of long, stable cultural historical practices of the curriculum? Yes, I mean, I, th I think it, the, of the three concepts of curriculum that I probably I mentioned in that PowerPoint, um, we have the intended curriculum, what's supposed to happen. And then the enacted curriculum, and then most importantly, the experience curriculum. And so in this situation, I think it's people said the, the, the intended curriculum is we need to move on to digital interaction because people can't meet face to face. So that was the intention. And then that was then enacted by, um, by educators and people were constructing meaning depending upon what kind of resources they had available to them, their familiarity with digital means of engaging and interacting with students. Um, and they're also interacting with new platforms such as Zoom and Teams that came along. And people were finding that, you know, for instance, people say that Zoom is far better for doing this kind of activity and that Teams is less good for this type of activity and people are, discovered this through engaging in it. So I think it's very much about the enacted curriculum. And in many areas in vocational education, one of the problems that we've been facing for a long time is that governments come up with these prescriptions of what is to be taught and what is to be assessed. And then the difficulty has been how that is enacted because it doesn't work out in, in, the, in the same ways that, that that's intended. And one of the things that's come up, certainly in this country, when schooling had to be done through homes, was that many young people didn't have at home laptops, didn't have tablets. So the enactment there also had to extend to trying to provide those kind of resources, but also have the resources in accessible forms for learners who were not ready to engage with it. So I think we can use those key concepts of curriculum, the intended curriculum, and you know, one would hope that there is a clear intention behind these things to have um, you know, a, a, an approach to education, which is based on digital engagement and digital interaction, and then how it's enacted and how people address the particular problems they have. 
And some of the issues I'm hearing is that some courses fine. They're all based around text. So it's not a real problem to actually um, um, translate text into digital form. But for instance, your colleagues who are working in physiotherapy, what they have to do is produce videos of small uh, exercises for students to learn how to manipulate people's elbows or necks or arms or shoulders. Um, and so even the, that, that kind of instruction has to be done in a particular way. And then of course, you then have to come up with ways in which the assessment can be done. And so for instance, in physiotherapy, what I'm aware of is that students have to take videos of themselves um, working with people to demonstrate they have, have the skills. So I think it's, it's that enactment of, uh, of the curricula that is where these issues are, are, are played out and that anthropology, can, I, think, I think, can be helpful there because anthropology isn't always about long-standing processes. For instance, the work of Chuck Dara, D-A-R-R-A-H, um, his work was looking at how um, a computer manufacturing company in California, the work that went on there and how problem solving went on there um, through the design of computers and the manufacturing of computers. So um, it, I think it's, it, it, by looking at the practice, you can help understand how, how the, the tasks that people are faced and what they're engaging with. And what was interesting about Dara's study, by the way, was that what he found was that the company gave huge amount of support and a huge amount of attention to the computer designers, but gave very little support and very little um, uh, guidance to the people who are manufacturing the computers. And they were having to deal with all sorts of very um, intricate problem solving associated with the supply of components um, which were not always available to, to make the computers and to keep up with a production of computers. And what they found was that although the computer designers were very well paid, um, very um, 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 well supported with professional development, had nice offices, they were engaging in problem solving um, at the same level as the production workers who were actually trying to produce the computers. So what was interesting there was that a group of workers, through, through understanding what they did, it was realized that the actual production workers were engaging a lot of problem solving activities. So I think that's the sort of insights that um, anthropology can bring, not just with stable practices, but practices that, that change. Okay. Uh, maybe I will just uh, try to attempt a very quick translation, a synoptic translation into French, because uh, yeah. uh, this yeah. question was raised yesterday by Isabel, and she asked that if we can do some uh, short translations in French, that would be helpful. So I will just try to do that. It will just. Laurent, j'ai mis. Je suis en train de faire un un résumé en français en fait. Okay, par écrit. Par écrit, ouais. Okay, d'accord. Et du coup, bah, je, je l'enverrai. Euh, okay. Sur le chat. Merci beaucoup. Très bien. Merci, Laurence. De rien. Okay, so Laurence is uh, trying to do a, a, um, a summary in French by written, in written form. So it's, it's, we don't need to translate it in uh, orally. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Laurence. Any other questions or topics? Uh, oui, Axel. Um, Je suis désolée, ce sera en français. Mais allez-y. Euh... Je parle pas anglais. Ouais. Désolée. Allez euh, euh, bonjour. En fait, euh, voilà, notre groupe a émis une question hier à propos des, des situations qui, qui provoquaient des difficultés. En fait, la difficulté. Enfin, le, je ne sais pas comment expliquer. Euh, C'est-à-dire que dans une situation, la difficulté était reliée à la situation en plus de la difficulté qui, qui, qui augmentait avec euh, la pratique. Je ne sais pas si c'est clair. Pour l'instant, ça l'est. <rire> ok, <rire> merci. Euh, donc, euh, dans un métier d'infirmier ou d'infirmière, par exemple, la difficulté, elle est de percevoir euh, 
euh, l'état d'une personne, euh, l'état du patient, par exemple, euh, sans respirateur, mm -hmm. qui est une difficulté déjà pour le novice, mais la difficulté, elle est réellement de percevoir cette chose. Et, et ce sera la même difficulté euh, quand l'infirmière ou l'infirmier euh, est plus expert, parce qu'il devra de nouveau percevoir, mais avec, euh, par exemple, un respirateur, l'état du patient, voilà, avec la manipulation de, de l'artefact, etc. Voilà, et on se demandait si ce n'était pas une difficulté qui était reliée à, à certains métiers euh, d'urgence vitale, enfin, plus particulièrement, voilà, que ces métiers-là, ils avaient peut-être une, une difficulté... Euh, augmenter, je ne sais pas, relié à cette urgence. C'est ça. Okay. Les autres... Ouais, je, vois, je vois bien l'exemple. Le, Par contre, j'ai de la peine à percevoir la question. Euh, euh, C'est du groupe... En lien avec les tâches difficiles à prendre. Voilà. Voilà. D'accord, donc euh, la... L'apprentissage du diagnostic ouais. de la respiration, voilà. c'est une tâche difficile à apprendre. Ouais. Ouais. Et du coup, elle est, elle est difficile, euh, pas seulement à apprendre, mais elle est difficile aussi pour les experts, c'est ça Voilà. En fait, c'est une, une difficulté qui est reliée plus à une situation, à un métier, à une profession. Parce qu'elle est reliée à l'urgence vitale de, de, de quelqu'un. Enfin, à une urgence vitale. C'est ça, ça, Anda, oh, Béa et tout ça ça joue ça... Oui, c'était ça. Au fond, on n'avait pas okay. compris qu'est-ce que c'est une tâche difficile à prendre. Si c'est une tâche à laquelle on arrive après, bien. à travers d'autres tâches qui, si on les fait, on n'a pas une responsabilité si grande ouais. comme la tâche finale qu'on doit faire ou si c'est autre chose. Ou si okay. c'est applicable à toutes sortes de situations ou c'est spécifique à des situations où il y a une responsabilité plus grande. D'accord. Donc, on peut dire que les. Enfin, on pourrait lui demander de clarifier un peu la. Qu'est-ce qu'une tâche difficile à apprendre mmh. Parce qu'elle peut être difficile à apprendre parce que c'est. Euh... La difficulté vient du fait que c'est un novice qui l'a fait et donc mmh. elle est difficile parce qu'elle n'est pas maîtrisée. Ou ouais. elle peut être difficile, euh, on va dire, intrinsèquement et même pour les ouais. experts. Voilà. D'accord mmh. Je vais essayer de ouais. le, le dire en anglais. <rire> Merci. OK, so we, uh, we had a question from one group about the concept of. Uh, difficult to learn activities. So we're not in, in the curriculum concepts. So um, the, the observation made by students was that um, what we, I mean, what you, what you term a, a difficult to learn task, I mean, the, the, um, there might be different situations or different sorts of difficult tasks. For instance, uh, a task might be difficult to learn because uh, of the novice or because you are a new person um, and you are not familiar with the task. So the difficulty might raise from the fact that it's performed by a novice, but it might also uh, be related to the complexity or to the specificities of the task itself. And it might still be difficult task even for experts. For instance, and the, the example was, how do you diagnose? I mean, so we are nursing uh, in healthcare And sometimes when you work in intensive care, you, you must make a diagnosis about respiratory um, um, dimensions. And so it's, it's a difficult task to assess the type of um, respiration of the patient when you are novice, but it's still very difficult to do so when you are an expert. So the question was, in your definition of uh, um, hard to learn task, um, Uh, I mean, how can you define this and also how can you account for the fact that sometimes the difficulty might uh, arise from the novice and sometimes it might also arise from the task itself and even for experts, it might be difficult to perform. Yes, I, I mean, I must, I have to say that my key focus has been on identifying tasks that people find difficult to learn and I would see Um, rightly or wrongly, by the way, I would see that um, um, a, a person's ability to engage in that is best understood through their readiness to engage in that task. And by readiness, I refer to um, whether they have the understandings, the concepts um, to, and, and procedures to engage with the task. 
The reason that I was keen to identify these hard to learn tasks is that they're the ones that require support for learning. And they're often ones which um, the, the knowledge is hidden. And I think things like respiratory systems, um, you, you wouldn't necessarily see some of the symptoms or some of the understandings, they're hard to engage with. So I think some tasks are difficult to access and difficult to understand simply because you cannot directly experience them. Um, I made reference yesterday to a large secondary processing plant that turned magnesite ore into magnesite crystals. What happened in that factory was that there were a group of people who actually built the factory. They actually constructed it, including the kilns where they, they make the crystals. So those workers actually knew what happened and those workers actually were involved in testing and getting the plant going. So they had understandings about those tasks, but that's a kiln that operates seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and it is very high temperature and you can't go near it. Um, you have to have protective gear even to take samples from it. So for the next generation of workers, it was very difficult for them to understand what was going on because you can't experience it directly. So there had to be processes whereby workers could come to understand that because they couldn't experience it directly. So there's those kind of tasks that um, you can't experience directly, um, that can be difficult to learn. There's also tasks that have uh, symbolic and conceptual knowledge behind them, which um, can be very difficult to learn because of the demands of understanding them. So I would see the problem as having two dimensions. Firstly, tasks that um, are actually just very complicated um, and they have a complex of factors associated with them. Then you've got tasks which are very difficult to learn simply because you have difficulty experiencing them, accessing them. And you have that trajectory, but then you also have um, the readiness of learners to engage with them. Um, and you know, that, there's, there's two different sets of factors there, I think. But so some ta that's why I was keen to try and identify those tasks which are difficult to learn because they're the ones that people said they needed support for for learning. Does that begin to get close to responding to your question, Laurent? All yep. the questions? It was uh, Axel's questions, actually. Uh, yeah, Axel. sorry, uh, Axel's question. Yeah, sorry. Il y a besoin de, de traduction ou ça va comme ça? Le micro, le micro. Je veux bien une toute petite traduction, ce serait gentil, s'il vous plaît. D'accord, quelqu'un veut essayer la traduction? Non. Oui, moi, je veux bien essayer. Merci. Alors, allez, je veux bien essayer parce qu'à la fin de ma traduction, il y aura une autre question. <rire> D'accord. Êtes... Alors, si j'ai bien compris, il y a une connaissance cachée. Et cette connaissance cachée, derrière euh, l'expérience ou euh, l'activité de task, mm -hmm. euh, c'est ce dont le euh, professeur Billette euh, euh, étudie. Mm -hmm. Donc, c'est cette connaissance-là qui va s'approprier. Et, euh, et en fait, toutes les, les difficultés derrière ces tâches, c'est ça que c'est cet élément-là que on va essayer de rendre compte. C'est ça. Oui. Alors moi, c'est une partie de la réponse. D'accord. Um, hidden task, knowledge is hidden task. Mm -hmm. Et ce que professeur Billet essaie de nous faire comprendre. On doit to engage, justement, on doit euh, provoquer. Comment je peux expliquer to engage euh, On doit provoquer euh, cet, euh, cet engagement. Engagement, oui. Oui, je, oui. Euh, pour, pour comprendre, pour comprendre l'apprentissage. Mm -hmm. Alors, est-ce que je peux poser ma question par rapport à ça 
Alors, elle, enfin, je, je vais juste euh, compléter parce que là, donc là, donc ce qu'a ce qu répondu euh, Billette par rapport à cette question de la, la tâche difficile à apprendre, c'est que euh, pour lui, il y a deux, euh, il y a deux situations, il y a, il y a deux cas de figure qui peuvent être aussi euh, enfin, combinés, et, enfin, ou deux, deux motifs ou deux raisons qui font qu'une euh, qu tâche peut être considérée comme difficile à apprendre. Soit elle peut être difficile à apprendre parce qu'elle est, euh, elle présente, c'était la, la, la réponse de, de Christelle, euh, elle présente des complexités intrinsèques au niveau conceptuel, au niveau procédural ou au niveau euh, dispositionnel. Donc c'est une tâche complexe. Euh, mais il y a une autre raison qui fait qui, qui fait qu'elle peut être difficile à apprendre, c'est parce qu'elle peut être très difficile à euh, à observer ou à expérimenter. Hein, par exemple. Euh, quand on doit travailler dans des, dans des hauts fourneaux pour faire des alliages, il y a des choses qu'on ne peut pas voir parce qu'on ne peut pas être à l'intérieur du fourneau pour comprendre les processus chimiques qui se jouent. Ou bien on, peut, on peut difficilement apprendre à piloter un Boeing 747 directement en s'asseyant dans le cockpit. Donc, il faut parfois... Euh, il, y a des, il y a des tâches qui sont difficiles à apprendre parce qu'elles ne sont pas accessibles dans les conditions réelles ou bien elles sont très rares. Par exemple, si on doit apprendre à gérer des accidents nucléaires, ce n'est pas évident parce que ça arrive heureusement pas très souvent qu'il y ait des accidents nucléaires. Ou bien pour revenir à la situation d'Isabelle tout à l'heure, si on doit apprendre à faire un virage à 180 degrés dans la manière de produire de la formation en la digitalisant, eh bien, on ne peut pas l'expérimenter facilement parce que ce n'est pas non plus tous les, tous les ans que ça arrive. Donc une autre raison qui fait qu'une tâche peut être difficile à apprendre, c'est qu'elle peut être rare ou difficile à expérimenter euh, ou, euh, ou à, à percevoir. Voilà, c'était juste pour compléter la réponse. Euh, Merci. Que euh, je... Attends, attends, deux, ah, deux, en fait, c'est juste une, une, un petit raccord. Donc, en fait, ça n'a ça rien à voir avec une situation particulière euh, d'urgence vitale, euh, enfin, d'urgence dans un, un métier particulier, ou bien bah, Donc, ce n'est pas, pas que dans les situations d'urgence médicale et ce n'est pas uniquement okay. les activités urgentes ou, euh, ou euh, inattendus qui sont des tâches difficiles à prendre. Okay. Un, un bûcheron, un enseignant ou euh, quelqu'un qui fait de la vente dans une boulangerie, il est confronté à des tâches difficiles à prendre. Euh, dans tous les métiers, je pense qu'on peut diagnostiquer oui. des tâches qui sont plus ou moins difficiles à prendre, mais peut-être pour différentes raisons. D'accord, okay. Okay. Donc, yeah. ok. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Euh, Christelle, je vous laisse poser votre question. Oui. Alors, au, au regard de tout ce qu'on vient de dire, ça c'est vraiment important pour moi parce qu'il y a une petite confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, professeur Billette, um, I, I would like to know, um, you, you said that the, the curriculum, um, it's a course of activities. And then, what, um, when we identify those activities which are very difficult to access or because you, you just said the knowledge is hidden, Um, uh, with a task, once we identify um, a difficult task, can we say that it's a teachable moment? No, no, um, a no, sorry, I'll come to that later, but a teachable moment is an activity which you can learn a lot from. Um, it might be, but Um, a teachable moment is a particular quality of experience, and I'll be referring to that today, and I'll, I'll refer to these pedagogically rich activities. Um, mm -hmm. And there might be, it, it could be the case that they, it might be the case that both are the same, but um, the, the task which is very difficult, I've got a good example here, which I'll be referring to, and that's making lace. And I think the word, French word is, Dentelle. La dentelle. Dentelle. Mm -hmm. Dentelle. Lace. Lace. Yeah. Uh, you know with it. Yes. Um, okay. um, yes. Lace. Dentelle. Lace. Dentelle. Yeah. Dentelle. Yeah. Dentelle. Yes. Dentelle. Yes. Lace. Yeah. yeah. Now, when you make lace, you mm -hmm. have to have multiple needles mm -hmm. and bobbins, mm -hmm. and you have to be able to manipulate them in a particular way. And um, the way you learn that is by observing and being helped by somebody who can actually make lace and show you how to do it. Because it's very unlikely you would learn to do that 
by discovery alone. And that's where you'd need assistance. So one of the ways of thinking about it is the kind of tasks that you would not learn by discovery alone. So for instance, you could put me on a piano and I would never be able to play the piano the way that Beethoven, or no, Rachmaninoff plays the piano. Um, I, you know, it would take me many lifetimes if I was just doing trial and error. But if I had somebody that came along and showed me how to play, that would close the gap. So there are some things that you can learn by observing and, and listening and imitating and practicing. And that is a lot of what we learn. But then there are some things which you're unlikely to learn by discovery alone. And it's often those things which um, you require assistance and support for. And it's interesting, as I go well, later, I'll go for this list of, um, of where there is these practice pedagogies and many of those relate to the learning of tasks, which it's difficult to learn through discovery alone. So uh, Dantel, making lace, mm -hmm. um, would be one of those. And, and that's in one of the papers that I'll be referring to, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, um, the difference then is a task which is very difficult and you require somebody to assist you, to somebody to help you understand that. Um, but that's quite, it, it can be the same, but I think it's different from those activities which by their very qualities are what I refer to as being pedagogically rich. And I'll come to those later and try and explain what I mean by those. Thank you very much. Is that helpful? Yeah. Yes, 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 because it was a bit confusing. Um, yep, the, yep. the teachable yes. moment, yes. yeah. And yesterday yep. we had an activity to do and um, and then we had this difficulty within our groups, how yeah. to identify this sequence. Yes. Yeah. But one thing I will say here, and I made the point in the video, is that I've interviewed people in workplaces who are experienced and people who are novices. And I often find that the novices are better at telling you um, what is difficult to learn and what is not difficult to learn because they've recently gone through the process. And that is related to something I talked about yesterday, which is the process of proceduralization. That once you've learned to do something, um, you can do it without conscious thought, but, and it seems easy, but the learning of it initially was quite difficult. Uh, and we, we encounter this when we, try and teach our children how to tie the shoelaces. We do it without thinking. And then we try and tell our child, you have to do this. And then you realize what we're telling them is not what you're actually doing um, because it's become so automated. So um, that's why I think it's important we talk to people who recently learned because they're the ones that probably know what is what is difficult about the task to learn about the task, but they also might give you um, interesting insights into how they learn the task. Okay. Moi j'ai une question. Oui. Alors on vous écoute. Euh, ma question concerne évidemment la simulation. La question c'est est-ce que Pour M. Billet, il voit, lui, une différence dans la gestion des curriculums en faisant de la simulation de, de haute fidélité, de haute intensité versus l'apprentissage sur, sur le lieu de travail concrètement en gestion de crise. Je ne sais pas si je suis clair, mais... D'accord, donc là, la question, c'est est-ce que, est -ce que les, les processus d'apprentissage sont différents entre la... C'est ça, parce que je n'arrive pas à bien faire la différence. Est-ce que c'est pareil ou pas je, je... Est-ce que pour lui c'est pareil ou pas? C'est ça la question. Ok. So uh, we have a question uh, from um, Antoine who works in the in the field of uh, medical, the medical field, and um, so he's involved in uh, in um, simulation training through simulation, and so he has a general question: uh, uh, whether 
if you think there is a, a difference uh, in terms of um, learning between um, high fidelity simulations or learning through simulation and um, learning through traditional practice or learning through uh, um, the direct experience of the work situation. So it's a question about other differences in terms of learning between uh, uh, learning through simulation and learning through practice. Okay. I think it depends upon what is being learned, but also how, how high fidelity the simulator is. Um, I'll give you some different examples here. Um, uh, uh, sometimes it's very, very important that simulations are undertaken. So in the medical field, um, for some years, I was on the ethics committee for what I'll call the Brisbane City Morgue. That is where people who die and they need to be, um, the cause of death needs to be ascertained. And we gave ethics approval for doctors to come in when they're learning how to use an instrument which you go down the ear canal. And it's very important that they learn to practice this because if they make a mistake and they pierce the ear canal with the tool, the patient will die. So in that simulation, it was very important that we gave them permission to practice on dead people, cadavers, people who had died and were retained under the Coroner's Act. So the certain circumstances where simulations are almost essential, and that is where we need to develop skills in ways so we don't risk the lives of people or the people's safety. And where I've done some work on that is with pilots um, and high fidelity simulators with pilots. And the point is that when those pilots are in the simulators, they actually are engaged in um, these activities in a very authentic way. And I've seen pilots who are very experienced because the, the research project was uh, what happens when a pilot goes through their annual test every year. And also if they're upgrading from being a first officer to being a captain. And these pilots are very experienced pilots. And what you see under their arm is perspiration. Um, and you see them sweating and you see them stressing when they're in a simulator, they know they're in a simulator and they're flying along in a simulator and all of a sudden an engine catches fire or they have a bird strike or a hydraulics failure. And you can see by their reaction that they actually think they're in a real, a real plane. And I was given control of the plane in a simulator and I knew that it was a simulator. I knew it was a, wasn't a plane. And my job was to take the plane down a runway and then fly flights. And my heart was beating very, very heavily. So even though I knew I was in a simulator, the impact upon me and the pilots. And I remember one of the pilots talking about coming to land at a particular runway and he commented on how the updraft from the runway as the plane goes down onto it was very strong. So he knew it was a simulator. He knew he wasn't landing at that airfield, air but he actually engaged. So I think the important thing with simulators is they need to be used when they need to be used. And if, what's the important thing is if the person using them really believes that they are engaging in an authentic activity. And seeing these pilots and how they reacted to the, the emergencies they had to respond to uh, was, was, was really you know, quite remarkable. And they weren't casual about it. They were very serious about it. So when those pilots do those trips, they know they're being tested and they know the plane will take off and something will happen. A patient, a passion to get sick, a hydraulics failure, engine fire, um, something will happen. They know it's going to happen, but even though they know that, they know they're in a simulator, the way they respond is that they're, they, that they're sort of um, authentically engaged. Mm -hmm. um, and there's another kind of 
simulator that's very important for aviation, which isn't a high fidelity simulator. It's called a low fidelity simulator. And that is, it's, it's like the equivalent of the cabin, the, um, the cockpit, and it has the instruments in front of them and two chairs. And what that's about is developing communication skills between the captain who sits in the left-hand seat and the first officer who sits in the right-hand seat. And there again, they need to be able to work very effectively as a team and understand their roles. Now this to all intents and purposes is like two chairs and a kind of cardboard cutout. Well, it's not a cardboard cutout. It's, it's, it's quite, can be quite complex. So that's not high fidelity, but there's a role of that simulation of knowing how these people work together. Because what we know is that in terms of um, aircraft crashes, um, when air airplanes have crashes, the majority of them are actually not about mechanical failure. They're about a lack of communication between the pilot and the co-pilot. And so that's a different kind of simulator. And again, but it's there for a very important purpose, but it allows them pilots to develop the skills. And I know in, in healthcare that there's a lot of work being done to try and create um, um, simulate, simulators, um, so simulations, so that surgical teams can come to work um, together. Um, and I've heard different views in terms of their effectiveness. Um, but again, I think the simulation is, um, it's what is appropriate for the skills to be learnt. And one time I was at Imperial College in London and they had all these million dollar simulator, oh, sorry, million pound, um, million pound simulators. But on the floor, what there was, was a whole pile of medical staff working on watermelons. And they were practicing taking um, pieces out of uh, patients' skulls. And the way they were practicing was to practice the skills using watermelons. Because you know a watermelon, it's got the skin on the outside, the heart on the outside, then on the inside it's red. And they were learning to um, make these cuts in somebody's skull, and they were learning on watermelons, which I thought was terrific and interesting. And it just shows you that all the, the simulators don't have to be million pound or million euro simulators, that if there's an activity which can be done relatively low cost, but helps people develop a particular set of skills, um, that can be useful. So sorry, just to sum up, sum up and I apologize for my very long answers. Um, it's, it's important to work out where simulators, simulations are necessary, crucial. And I think it's also um, important then that to, to have simulators that people are engaging in authentically. Uh, and that's where, uh, I think that's where their pedagogical strength comes from. I'm sorry if that was very difficult to understand. Apologies. Antoine. Je t'ai fait une, je t'ai fait nouveau. Uh, Antoine, je t'ai fait un truc nouveau. Ouais. Magnifique. On a, on a Merci beaucoup. <rire> Super, thank you. Je vais pas tenir jusqu'à midi, mais. Yeah. Ok. Sorry, is my, are my answers too long? No, no, no. But uh, Lawrence is uh, is becoming specialized in uh, performing written translations online. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you, Lawrence. <laughs> I'm sorry to Antoine for my very long answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. So looking forward to receiving Lawrence's translation. Um, any other uh, questions or comments that raised uh, were raised by the groups yesterday? So it wasn't raised by the group, but I have the question now. Yeah, please. Um, please. Can a uh, hard task be difficult for someone, but not for someone else. And how does it affect the curriculum? Because if you think that this task is difficult and you plan it as a difficult task, but for the novice, it's not difficult at all because I don't know, she or he has special skills or stuff. 
how does it affect the curriculum, so the enacted curriculum and the experienced curriculum? Yeah, that's a good, it's a good question. Um, colleagues from Britain found that um, with modern technology, you know, with apprenticeship, there is supposed to be the apprentice who's learning from the older, more experienced worker. What they found was that relationship was turned around because with new technologies, um, the, um, some of the younger people were far more adept, far, far more um, competent in using electronic technology. And they were actually helping the trades workers who didn't have that understanding. So the, the whole apprenticeship thing was kind of being turned around a bit. Um, is, that, is that the question you're asking or is it, um, is it about the, the fact that some people will find tasks more easy than others? Yes. Yeah. So I don't have an example yet, but I thought maybe a hard task can be thought as difficult because it was difficult yeah. for, I don't know, the novice for one year, but yes. it's not difficult yeah. for the new ones for no. some reasons. Yes. And I mean, so the, and you're quite right. And in terms of, for, for instance, what is non-routine, a non-routine problem solving, which I was talking about yesterday, what for one person will be a non-routine problem, for another person that will be a very routine problem. Now, the normal, the normal trajectory is that as the more experienced you are, the problem becomes um, routine. Um, and but and the more the less the less experienced you are, it's non-routine. So, talking to um, a, a physician, and in an emergency department, he was saying that often medical students and junior doctors are really shocked on Friday night and Saturday night in emergency departments when people come in who've had car crashes. They've had sporting accidents, they've been drinking and people have been fighting. But for a very, very experienced um, emergency physician, this is routine. This isn't shocking. This is not new. And they're not surprised by it. But for novices. So that's the often that's the how that's often seen between the difference. But you could also, which I think is what you're saying, is because of your personal experience you could have had a lot of access to particular experiences so that what people think will be difficult might not be difficult to learn. And an example that comes to mind, I'm sorry if my examples are very long, but many medical um, students find surgery a very difficult area to work in and find it very confronting and they find the environment very, very difficult. And we came across one in one study, we came across a, um, a woman who said, I don't find it intimidating. I don't find it a problem. And uh, she was the daughter of two doctors and she had grown up involved in lots of things because her parents were in a small town in New Zealand. She also said that she prepared very well for any of these practical situations but that she knew how to conduct herself. And so what for some other people was a very difficult learning situation for her, it wasn't confronting and it wasn't difficult. So I think you're right. I think there are person dependent processes around it. And I know for instance, that doctors who are training to be pediatricians, that is doctors who work with children those who don't have children themselves or haven't had access to children often really struggle to know how to interact with children. Yet doctors or medical students and junior doctors that have had lots of access to young children, for them, it's not a problem because they're quite used to interacting with, with children and, um, and younger people. So I think it's, you're right. I think there's an element of it which is person dependent, depending upon what you've previously experienced. Valsener, Jan Valsener refers to this as the pre-mediate experiences. 
the kind of experiences that you've had, which prepares you for engaging in the experience of the moment. Um, so depending upon what you've experienced previously, um, you might you know, be able to engage with something um, productively where another person might not be able to engage it productively. So I think it's the, the kind of experience you've had earlier, which then the, the kind of learning you have, the knowledge you have, um, which shapes how you engage with that, the, the particular experience. So that's the person dependence side of it. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody need a translation or is this okay? Any other questions or comments regarding yesterday's activities, curriculum concepts or workplace learning concepts? Okay, so this, if this is not the case, uh, thank you very much, Stephen, for responding to these uh, different, different, different questions. So it's, I think it's good because we came back to uh, most of the concepts we discussed yesterday afternoon. So I think it was a, a productive uh, moment. Uh, I suggest um, maybe we do a short break now. So there's a, a kind of uh, transition between uh, this discussion session and uh, your uh, talk um, on uh, guided learning and uh, pedagogic practices. And so I suggest we meet again at 10 o'clock Geneva time. So this will be in 15 minutes. And so we'll, maybe we'll do another short break uh, later in the, in the morning. So uh, I think it's, it's good if we have this just time for doing a coffee or tea so that we have a small break. It, how does this sound? It's, it's okay for you? Yeah. Yep. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Okay, so we'll be back in 15 minutes. Okay, so I, ho I hope you enjoyed the break. Had a coffee or tea or anywhere, anything else. So I just wait until everybody's back. Okay. Donc vous avez vous avez vu que Lawrence a mis dans le chat la la forme écrite et traduite en français de quelques réponses de, de Stephen. Lawrence, vous êtes vous êtes là. Ok. Je voulais juste voir avec vous si c'est ok de que je mette ce document sur Moodle. Mm -hmm. Vous êtes d'accord avec ça? Mm -hmm. Ok. Donc, je le, je le mettrai, euh, vous va télécharger là si vous pouvez, parce qu'une fois que le, le chat sera, sera fermé, ce sera peut-être plus difficile d'accéder. Mais je l'ai je sauvé et je le mettrai sur, sur Moodle. Merci encore. OK, so Stephen, uh, I, I give you the, the floor now for presenting your presentation for this uh, morning session. Thank you, Laurent. And I will... I will just Okay, hopefully you can see that. Yes. It's good. Okay. So, um building upon the ideas presented yesterday and we've just had the review and I want to now discuss with you the ideas of guided learning and guided learning strategies. <clears throat> and then going on to consider workplace pedagogic practices and the importance of personal epistemologies. And then this, this afternoon, your time in the middle of the night for me, um, we'll be considering how we integrate 
students' workplace experiences in their tertiary education programs, vocational education, higher education. And we've considered this recap of, in this recap of workplaces as learning environments, the various contributions and limitations to it. And you've brought up good examples of some of the complications that are brought about by contemporary changes, for instance. And you also discuss these ideas of the, the, the learning, the work or the workplace or the practice curriculum. So a key consideration here is that workplace experiences alone may not be sufficient. Therefore, we need to organize them, to augment them, and potentially to integrate them for tertiary students. So the organizing is the practice curriculum. The augmentation comes from the pedagogic practices and how how the learners engage using their personal epistemologies and then how we come to integrate those experiences. So the, the overall concern here is how can we make workplaces more effective learning environments for workers and also for students. Sorry, I should say workplaces and work practices. So um, one approach is to consider guided learning at work. And I have a definition here. It refers to a more experienced coworker using techniques and strategies to guide and monitor the development of the knowledge of those who are less skillful, novices. Uh, this approach places the emphasis, the onus on the learner to engage in the thinking and acting uh, required for rich learning. And that is the learners are encouraged and pressed into knowledge construction and reinforcing activities are provided by the more experienced co-worker. So this was work I did some time ago, 2000. And I engaged in a series of studies across different kinds of workplaces to, to evaluate the concept of guided learning at work. The key idea behind it is that it's the learners that need to do the thinking and acting, that they need to be pressed into considering, making decisions and coming up with responses and then monitoring those responses. And it's very much about putting the learner in the driver's seat, not in the passenger seat, in the driver's seat. Now, a project I was involved with, with medical um, junior doctors, what in Britain is called FY1 and FY2 doctors, doctors in their first and second year. Um, what that found was that although these doctors during their medical education had spent a lot of time in the workplace, that on that Monday morning, when they first became practicing doctors, sometimes they weren't um, equipped. In fact, of the ones that we um, interviewed, all of them said that when it came to that Monday morning, when they became doctors and they were making the clinical decisions, they found that they were deficit in their knowledge. And much of it had been that throughout their medical education, they had been shadowing other people and they hadn't actually been making the clinical decisions themselves until that Monday morning. So the importance of putting the learners in the driver's seat so they're making the decisions um, and doing the thinking and acting that's required for the work. So, um, a guide, some, some premises here is that individuals actively learn more than they are taught. So this comes from the work of Barbara Rogoff, who's looked at traditional apprenticeships, apprenticeships uh, within um, diverse cultures. And that um, Valsner, Jan Valsner, has made the observation that didactic teaching, that is a transmission of knowledge, is limited in its efficacy, exactly what I'm doing now. And, and it's also said by the anthropologist 
um, in gold that guided learning, act, guided active meaning making may be more effective than direct teaching for much learning. So guiding the learners into, uh, into active thinking, and active act action is often more um, effective than direct teaching for much learning. And that's Tim, Tim Engel there. And this seems to be particularly appropriate for learning through workplace activities and interactions. And that expert guidance can make um, accessible knowledge which cannot be learned through discovery alone. And that was a point we were discussing earlier. So the expert there is to provide experiences, but then intervene when the novice will have difficulty accessing that knowledge because it is difficult to discover through discovery learning alone. So um, often this is referred to as mentoring in, for instance, the human resource development literature. And that literature suggests that there is four levels of mentoring. There's the kind of mentoring that goes across somebody's working life where somebody will provide support and say, well, you should try this. Here's an opportunity, do that. And then there can be about providing experiences and monitoring progress. And then there can be the direct guidance that's provided by one person working with another. And then there can be indirect guidance. And that is when the learner observes and imitates those whom they are um, observing and working closely with. And I guess much of what we're going to focus on is three and four here, this direct guidance in the workplace. And in terms of the development, what's this, the use of guided learning strategies? These were um, some strategies which were tried in, in workplaces in studies that I, I engaged in, in a range of enterprises in Australia. For the development of procedural skills, that is how you go about it, how you go about achieving goals. The classical approaches of modeling a task, coaching, and then scaffolding were tried. And then in terms of conceptual development, using questioning, diagrams, and explanations. And these strategies were used and trialed in the workplace. And then in terms of developing higher order capacities, the use of group discussions, often around production meetings or meetings where workers came together, and then also extending knowledge through the use of questioning. And it was these kind of strategies that I um, worked in workplaces, sometimes over the period of two years, preparing people in the workplace to be mentors or guides and for them to use these strategies. And when they were used, it was seen to be effective that when more experienced co-workers use those kind of strategies, it seemed, they seemed to be effective. However, um, there were factors determining strategy use in workplace practice. There was never enough time for them to be used. And also some of the people who were mentoring were concerned that they would develop skills in the people they were assisting and that would lead to them being displaced by that person. That person would might take their job because they'd passed on the knowledge to them. And please remember some of these workplaces were not professional workplaces, they were process and production workplaces where people didn't necessarily have educational qualifications didn't have educational certification. And they were concerned that then that if they passed on their skills to others, that they that the, the, the thing that stood them apart was their experience. They would be, um, uh, they would lose that, they would lose that quality. And the studies indicated the significance, the, 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 the helpfulness of workplace mentors, but also a lot of demands were made upon them. I don't think in any of the workplaces, the mentors were given extra time or extra support, that this came on top 
of the other tasks that they undertook and that, um, that whether the learners, the workers could get access to workplace activities and guidance and then be monitored by their mentors or guides was quite central to the quality of their learning. And here are some qualities that, um, this is again what, work, what people in workplaces have told me about the qualities of effective mentors. So in these workplaces where they reported the mentors had been effective, this is the qualities that workers told me. So having expertise in the work area, being an expert other can handle novel problems and they've actually got knowledge to pass on. They must be viewed as being credible, that is being competent, being seen as being competent. Often what happened is that in the, when I went to workplaces and said, I want to prepare somebody to be a mentor or a guide, um, I would get supervisors. And sometimes the supervisors were not actually competent in the field, in the, in the actual work. And so they didn't have the skills and understandings to pass on to workers. But I give you an example of where a worker was seen to be highly credible. Um, this is what's called a D9 dozer, a very large bulldozer that's used in open cut coal uh, mines to remove the overburden, to remove the soil that exposes the, the, the coal seam. In one of the mine sites, one of these um, dozers went over the coal wall and you can see the coal wall just there. And this piece of equipment, which is worth millions of dollars, was stranded down on the coal wall. And you can see a coal wall on the other side of the picture. What happened was one worker went down, got inside the cab, and then got the vehicle working, and then used the shovel at the front to actually create a roadway and gently drove the bulldozer out of the, the, the predicament it was in. And this man was seen as being a hero because he was very competent at doing it. And so that man has enormous credibility in the workplace. People take that man seriously. Whereas somebody with just a trainer on their white hat would not be seen as being credible. So it's helpful to be seen as being credible to being an expert in the workplace. And part of that then is understanding the goals for actual work performance, what is required to be successful in the work, in work performance and to actually value mentoring, see a need for it and the knowledge to be learned by the, the learners and having a willingness to share the knowledge and also be a guide for learners rather than being a teacher, not telling them things, but actually guiding the learning. So these were the views that came from people in that earlier study about um, what qualities of people who are good, effective workplace mentors. So um, that's that brief session a section on guided learning. Did you want to, uh, me to stop sharing now and we can discuss those before we move on or would you like me to keep going? What's your preference? Is, is there any questions around that guided learning? Is all that fairly straightforward? I do have one question. Thank you. Uh, I'm just looking for the page. Just sorry. <clears throat> it was at the beginning of the presentation. It was a statement that was saying, uh, individuals actively learn more than they are taught. Uh, page six. Yeah. yeah. Guided learning. Um. How can you establish this fact? Oh, I mean, how, how can Rogoff establish this fact? Yeah, that, that fact is, is, has been well researched across a whole range of fields. Um, I mentioned, I think yesterday, um, the development of, of, of language skills and vocabulary in children. 
And what it said is that uh, Bransford, for instance, the big study they did from Harvard, they found that children's learning of language was far, far higher and development of vocabulary was far, far higher than when they are being taught it. And the principle behind it really is that the projection of knowledge is the transmission of knowledge is what it is. It's the transmission of knowledge, but ultimately it depends upon the person making sense of it and engaging with it and you know, learning from it. So um, the, the more active engagement the learners, the more they're likely to be learning. So the, 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 the simple fact is that then this idea of, um, of, of learning being probably more effective than direct teaching is a general principle. However, there will always be areas where close instruction is required, and that's when there's this knowledge which is very difficult to learn. I mean, I, I could show you something that I sometimes, uh, this is, um, I don't know if you can, can you see this? Yes. This is what you call a regla. A regla? Yeah. Regla? Yeah. Regla? yeah. Okay. yeah. This is my wife's classroom. Um, she's a teacher. Now, if we take, um, I often use this when I'm explaining people's learning through work. And humans have lived in settled communities for about 5,000 years. And in, 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 in modern, modern societies, about 3,000 years. It is only in this period here and this is an exaggeration, by the way, that we've actually had educational institutions for the vast, vast, vast majority of people. And over this time, did people not learn? Did people not innovate? Did people not develop all sorts of artifacts? And certainly if you look at some societies such as China, um, when people in Europe were still living in very, very ordinary circumstances, some of the cities in China had reticulated water, they had street lighting, um, and very sophisticated social systems and very sophisticated skills. However, all of that proceeded in the absence of what is referred to as, sc as school societies where You've had education institutions. So we know that across most of human history, learning, innovation, and the development of human knowledge in the, the very capacities that allow us to, to be here and exist at this point in time, largely arose outside of teaching. They arose through processes of learning. And when you look at the anthropological literature, there are very, very few instances, and I'll be referring to some of them, that there was actually close interaction, hands-on, um, by um, more experts. Most of it was a process of, of learning. So we know historically that across most of human history, there hasn't been teaching, that teaching is a very, very recent uh, experience. And what we know now is that, for instance, for the development of the kind of occupational skills that people need is that the experiences provided in education institutions and through teaching is insufficient. Um, the other kind of experience are required and people need to engage with it. And also when you have high, le high level skills such as the kind of clinical reasoning that doctors have, that comes from episodes of experiences which are not taught and they're experienced and then the person who's engaging it has to engage in it in a way to make sense of those experiences and identify the links and associations um, amongst the factors which allow them to make diagnosis of patients' conditions. So that's kind of, you know, so there's uh, studies that have been done. The PIAT data, which I showed you, um, which I showed you yesterday, for example, from Scandinavia, you would see there that workers reported learning more through their own efforts than being assisted by others. That's that data that's very consistent. And there's a lot of, a lot of literature say that. In fact, most of the um, 
ideas for teaching that have come from constructivism is really about allowing um, us to, as educators, to provide experiences for students so that they come to engage in tasks and that they're engaging effortfully. So as I said the other day, sorry, as I said yesterday, when I used to work in vocational education, teaching students how to make garments, we would give them tasks, they would design a garment and they would make a garment up and they were involved very much in that activity. It was a very much an engaged process and they learned richly through that. So it was a process of them engaging in something which they thought was important. If they designed a garment, they had a lot of investment in it and they wanted to achieve the outcomes. So I think that's the principle that comes from that has been accepted, well accepted, I think, within, um, um, within education theory. If we look at um, uh, Scarmidlier's uh, Scar notion of reciprocal teaching and learning of maths and English, the process is used there is that the teacher models something and then the students then take in turns in actually engaging in that kind of activity. And so they're the kind of principles that have come from you know, a, a broad constructivist view about um, humans being meaning makers and how we need to approach that, that, that consideration educationally. Does that make sense, Fadi? Yes. The, that makes sense, yes. That makes uh, even, more, even more sense because you, you said another thing is that the, the guided, uh, guided learning yeah. was more effective in that. Sorry? Ah. Um, we, so we had this uh, school institution for maybe two, three centuries, that's right? Yeah. So before that, we didn't have it. Then we started the school institution, and now we're starting to recognize that uh, students or learners are the real, uh, they have the control of their, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, learning. Uh, the learning, learning process, yeah. Learning yeah. process. How yeah. do you explain that like, we're doing up, down, up? Maybe you well, can. I mean, you can answer that at the end of the yeah. presentation. Yeah, it's a very long question, but I mean, essentially, educational institutions were established by church or state, mm -hmm. and uh, much of the reasons they were established was about bringing social order, and you know, having societal order. And most of the nation states formed those um, education systems at the time when nation states were being formed, and much of it was about getting young people to be conformed and making sure that they were able to participate in the economy, but also making sure that they were, were able to fit in with the, the, the nation state. So that, I mean, if you go back and look, the, the, the first textbook, which has really been written about curriculum theory was only written in 1947 by Tyler. And in that book, Tyler defined curriculum as achieving experiences achieving the goals of the school. So what was important there was achieving the goals of the education institution, which was sponsored by the church or the state. So that's 1947, well, Ralph Tyler wrote the first seminal book on curriculum. Um, and since then, we've learned an awful lot about human meaning making, constructivism. And what we know is that for effective learning, um, you know, it's, it's all about getting the learner engaged. And that goes back to that idea of mastery and appropriation I was referring to yesterday, because if somebody's engaging in something superficially to pass the test, um, that kind of learning is not gonna be as rich as if the person takes interest in something and believes in and wants to pursue it. Thank you for your you. Uh, reply. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Okay, Sanu. Well, en fait, euh, au fur et à mesure qu'on avance, euh, je me pose beaucoup de questions, mais vraiment spécifiques à, à mon contexte professionnel, parce que je travaille dans un environnement où l'institution demande à tous les anciens, ils ont la mission de former des novices. 
Et puis, dans ce contexte-là, il y a autant de conceptions de ce que devrait être le travail ou le travail bien fait que de professionnel. Du coup, il n'y a pas quelque chose de commun forcément dans ces conceptions. Du coup, je me demande alors comment savoir qui est expert, qui ne l'est pas et puis euh, comment être sûr que ce qui est transmis aux novices est approprié parce qu'il n'y a pas beaucoup de procédures, de prescriptions, c'est plutôt informel. Et c'est quel contexte, juste pour, pour connaître le... C'est le contexte, contexte d'une commune. Bon, c'est vrai que c'est dans la médiation sociale et urbaine, et c'est un métier qui est en train de se construire. D'accord. Donc la médiation sociale et urbaine, c'est quoi C'est des, des interfaces entre les... Entre les la municipalité et les citoyens Voilà, la, la municipalité, les citoyens ou les, les médiateurs sociaux vont aller à la rencontre des habitants pour un peu faire des médiations en cas de conflit. De Là, des conflits de voisinage ou des choses comme ça Voilà. Ok. Et... Je, vais, je vais poser la question. Et, uh, ok, so Stephen, we had a question from uh, Sanou, um, who is uh, referring to uh, her a work context she knows well. And um, so the, this context is the context of um, um, social mediation. Uh, so for instance, people working in communities to facilitate or to, to, to try to assist in uh, conflict management or situation. I, I don't know if there, there is a, is this a, a profession in Australia called uh, social mediation or? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. So, So yeah. Sanu works in this context, and, and in this context, um, novices are guided by uh, people that are mentors or, or, um, or, or, or guides, or men yeah, mentors. But um, in, in this context, it's very difficult um, to share, uh, to have a shared understanding of work or shared values, because it's quite new and it's also quite specific. And so um, it's very also difficult to identify who are the experts and, and how is expertise defined. And um, so, I mean, she was uh, wondering if, um, if depending on the context, it might be possible to identify exactly who are the experts and, and uh, uh, what are the shared um, understanding of work uh, being um, related to this context. Yes, and, and that's, I mean, that's a common problem in areas where the knowledge is changing very quickly, such as in information technology, for instance, and some areas of health. And um, in health work, what's often referred to is the co-construction co um, and the translation to practice, where you have different people bringing particular understandings to deal with complex problems. Within information technology, where you have constant change, very few people are saying, I'm the expert anymore, but rather they follow a narrative along the, about the way that technology is changing and, and how they engage in it. And in that sector, a lot of people engage an awful lot, um, sorry, engage a lot with each other to develop shared understandings about the problems that they're dealing with. So I think that's very much the case when you've got new areas of, of knowledge, but also when things are evolving very quickly. So in healthcare now, there's a very strong move to have interprofessional working and learning. And that is people from across a range of occupations working together because you know, it's been realized, surprise, surprise, that many patients' issues need to be addressed with um, by a number of practitioners. And that concept of co-construction, co-engagement um, is, is in, that, in, in that field. I mean, I suspect the same thing is, because um, I know the kind of work that um, Sanun's referring to is often very confronting. It's very difficult work. Um, and there has to be support for, for workers doing that work because they're very frontline workers, but there also has to be special arrangements for novices because if novices um, have very bad experience, they may withdraw from that work. So finding ways, which is curriculum really, 
how do we introduce people into difficult and confronting situations in a way which is supportive of them and productive um, for them to engage in. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's, it's in some sense, it's a curriculum problem and how do we ease the person into it? By the way, it's probably the same, it's the same issue that many teachers face. Um, when teachers go from being a student teacher to having a classroom of students who might be very difficult to, to manage and they are on their own because you know, the classroom is theirs um, and how do they transition from being a student teacher to having their own classroom and engaging with students who might not be cooperative, who, who might be confronting and difficult. So it's, it's, I think it's a fairly, um, it's not a unique situation to um, social counseling. Um, and I think there's probably things that can be learned across fields where people come together to provide um, access. So in one of the projects that, that was part of the thing you'll be I'd pre-recorded, there was in the social work program, they had students going in pairs into um, do social work because they could provide mutual support. So it's two students going in, but they also had a place where the students could come to meet after the sessions so they could provide group support for each other. So I think it's those kind of mechanisms that are required in that work which can be confronting. And one of the issues is, of course, you can't predict it. You know, it could be a not, sorry, it could be no problem, or all of a sudden you have a big problem. So it's very difficult to predict. I don't know if that's helpful. Nous, ça va, là, vous avez besoin d'une traduction? Moi, ça va plus ou moins, j'ai compris euh, en gros. Parce que moi, ma crainte, c'était un peu que, enfin, ce que je pense observer, vu qu'il y a certaines divergences sur la conception du métier et que des fois même ça peut être assez conflictuel, le novice il va plus se ranger du côté, enfin la version du travail ou là où il a plus de connivence euh, suivant les affinités. Donc du coup, ça cause plus de problèmes qu'autre chose jusqu'à peut-être qu'il se crée son, son identité professionnelle, mais c'est vrai que Certains, entre guillemets, experts peuvent être perçus comme non crédibles parce qu'ils euh, ne sont pas de connaissance. Enfin, voilà, il y a des camps, c'est assez complexe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just uh, Sanu was also mentioning that one of the, the challenges of this particular context is that the, um, the, the, the supervisors or, or the, the, the mentors, uh, some, I mean, often they disagree. They do not share the same values and, and they do not see they do, do not respond to a challenging situation the same way. And so this is very challenging for novices because uh, they are confronted to contradictory instructions on, and, and often they have to align to the views of a mentor because they, they, are, they have a good relationship with this person. And uh, so it's very difficult for, for novices to identify who is the legitimate uh, expert and where expertise really is and so on. Yeah. And so this is um, a particularly, particularly complex situation in which experts yes. are, yeah. are not sharing uh, views yeah. and also are competing uh, between themselves for being, being the expert and being, being the legitimate depository yes. of knowledge. In the video, which we will be seeing later today, your time, um, I refer to preparing students to go into workplaces that are contested. And what sometimes happens is a student will go into a workplace and they'll be told, forget that rubbish you've learned at university. This is what we do here. And so part of preparing students is so that they, this might happen. And then putting them in a position where they, they're in a position where they say, oh, is this rubbish of what I've learned at the university? It might be rubbish but to get them to go along with whatever's going on to, within, within safety limits, but also to critically engage with it. So that in the talk this afternoon, that you'll be having this afternoon, 
there's a consideration of what happens before students go into the workplace. And part of that can be preparing students of how they engage with that kind of situation. And it happens quite a lot um, in, in, some, in some sectors where there's you know, strong views about what, what, is, what is correct practice. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Any other question on guided learning or shall we move forward? I have a question, but um, it is more general. I don't know if this fits here. Um, I just ask it and you can decide if you want to answer it. It's more about, I don't know, the, the, your philosophy behind uh, your reconceptualization of a curriculum born out of practice and not in a sense as prescribed by, um, by others that may not be involved in, in practice. Um, um, do you call for um, less government intervention in curriculum um, activities or even less intervention by academia being involved in the development of workplace curricula or should curricula then be generalizable at all because every workplace is different? Um, yeah, that's my, my question. Yeah. Okay. About, um, who is it obviously depends what... So it obviously depends upon what the intention is. So education should always be intentional. There should be clear intentions behind it. Now, if you're developing the skills of an occupation, it's important that people develop the canonical knowledge of that occupation. Whether we're talking about nurses, doctors, airline pilots, um, electricians, plumbers, whatever you're talking about. So there is the structure that's required and then there's knowledge which needs to be learned if that's the if, if that's the educational goal but then in terms of its implementation um there, you know, there is a lot of consideration at the local level of how it's enacted and how it's made sense of now if you look at the german model for instance they have agreement at a national level what is required but they also have negotiation at the local level to make sure that um you know, the occupational skills are relevant to that community, whatever that community is doing. So there's, 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 it's how we come about it. What we know is that teachers, for instance, have a key role in enacting the curriculum, but there's very few instances of teachers initiating curriculum because at, at its top level, because there's a few instances of where Montessori, for instance, has established an education system from a personal philosophy. There was that famous school in Britain called Summerhill, which had this very open educational process. But these are, these are quite exceptions, but most education provisions come from either uh, supported of church and state, and normally somewhere there is um, considerations of, of what uh, needs to be taught. And then the question then is, what happens at the local level in terms of how that's enacted and how that's designed and implemented. And one of the issues, of course, is if, if government is, is too top down, that you can have um, um, a lack of understanding of what is appropriate at the local level, because people in capital cities may not understand the kind of readiness of students in suburbs on the outside of big cities, of migrant communities, of communities that don't speak the, 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 the local language, there alone um, communities that are some distance from the center. So there's concepts put forward by Malcolm Skilbeck, for instance, called school-based curriculum development, which says, suggests that there should be decision-making at the local level. And one way of thinking about that is saying that you can establish the aims um, of education at a central level, but allow the enactment to be negotiated at the local level which can be sensitive then to the needs of local communities. Now, if we look at the, perhaps one of the schooling systems, which um, you know, within the Western world, which we would see as being you know, similar to perhaps to what happens in Switzerland, is Finland, um, which does very well on most of the scales. The teachers there have an awful lot of autonomy. They have a lot of autonomy to actually take what is stated nationally and then to implement that locally using their own professional expertise, responding to local needs, 
most principally the students that they teach. So it's, it's a question then of how the curriculum decision making is distributed. And when you have highly centralized national curriculum, that seems to be curriculum decisions. That seems to be when there's often a mismatch um, of, of, and a lack of understanding at the local level. And that's when you get problems. So, so, so it's a question of where that decision making comes. And then there's obviously other um, areas where we're not dealing with specific school skills to be developed or occupational skills. And then there's other processes um, and other considerations for those for those areas. So fundamentally, it's what, it, what is supposed to be achieved through the program? What are its goals? And then how can those goals best be achieved? I think it's that kind of thinking which um, is helpful. Unfortunately, in many countries at the moment, we're under regimes where governments want to be very directive about education. And that is, means that there's a lot of top-down decision-making being made, which is not always helpful, in my opinion, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. OK, Fadi. Fadi. Yeah. Yeah. I do have one last question. If indeed it's because of the the need to direct people that uh, um, favors this kind of education, uh, what, uh, in your opinion, will make things change about the way we see uh, learners and teachers? That's a very good question. <clears throat> um, hmm. It's a very good question, Fadi. Uh, at the moment, I've got uh, projects on the standing of vocational education. And as I mentioned yesterday, and looking fundamentally, how do we change people's perceptions of, of these things? It's very difficult. And I think it's, it's about positive examples, um, showing that it works, finding ways of engaging students um, and generating outcomes of that kind. Um, so anything to do with the societal sentiment that sees teaching being um, predominant um, is difficult. However, I would have thought that some of the changes that are going on now with this type of technology are a little bit overturning that because this kind of technology and this kind of engagement really moves away from um, the teacher teaching because there's got to be far more interaction within that. So perhaps, perhaps this kind of technology and the changes brought about by it. I mean, I, I heard one of my colleagues saying that he will no longer invite any international experts to the university to talk because there's nobody to talk to. The students don't come onto campus. So he says, why would I invite anybody here when the students won't turn up? So perhaps there are some changes there and perhaps you know, that's the focus that it's pressing students to engage in, in, in learning might be the way forward. But any of these issues about uh, of societal sentiments are always very difficult to, to change, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Should I progress? Yes, I think so. Okay. Thanks for that. So, where was I at? Here we are, that, that one. So, so, we need to find ways of supporting learning that occurs as part of everyday work activities. So as I've said to you that I, I did these series of studies trying to use those strategies, which I referred to in the previous slides. But what I found was that I would spend time preparing people in the workplace to be mentors or guides. And I would come back six months later and those people weren't there or they weren't practicing it or they, 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 it wasn't important to them anymore. And I came to the conclusion that um, 
what needed to happen is for there to be experiences that are part of work activities, not something in addition to them. So from the last sort of, what, 10 years or so, I've been looking at these ideas that how can we generate learning in the workplace and support learning in the workplace through the experiences that are already there and augment those where possible, rather than try and bring an educational approach into the workplace, such as through those guided learning strategies, which I mentioned earlier. Because I don't think in the long term, they're going to be successful. So um, the three concepts that I deal a lot with is the learning curriculum, the organization of experiences in the workplace, these concept of practice pedagogies and epistemological practices of the learner. And that's what I'm gonna be referring to now. So in terms of these practice pedagogies, and by the way, all this is set out in that handout, you've got all this stuff now is set out in that handout, is that these kind of pedagogies are different than classroom pedagogies. So the first one here is by Bridget Jordan. And this is what happens with, in Mexico with birth attendants, people learning to be what we would call midwives. And um, there the, the experienced midwife would walk around the village with the novice birth attendant and tell them stories about the different kinds of births that had occurred in the houses as they walked past them and, and, and how they'd gone about um, providing an effective birth or the problems that had occurred within that. Then there's the process of verbalization. Now, this is an example here of difficult to learn knowledge. And this Jeffrey Gowland's work was about potters in China, turning pots on the potter's wheel. And the, the experts would speak aloud as they're turning the pots to try and verbalize what they were doing so that the novices could hear and try and learn from a process which is very difficult to actually learn. And then there's these things called pedagogy activities, which are rich activities, which I'm gonna to refer to in a moment. And then there's these processes of guided learning and proximal guidance, which I've referred to. And then there's direct instruction or hands-on. And Makovic's work is about lace making and the way that they have to use the, the, the various needles and the bobbins to make the lace. And there, there was, uh, uh, the expert lace makers would place their hands on the novices to show them how to manipulate the needles and the bobbins in making lace because it was difficult to discover on your own. There were strategies there that um, you could get assistance when somebody placed hands on the novice to show them how to make the lace. And then there's indirect guidance, observation, and then there's these things called heuristics and mnemonics. Heuristics are what are referred to as tricks of the trade. And these are the strategies which you use to try and achieve an outcome. So many years ago, I used to have to measure men for suits. And whenever you try and measure a man for a suit, they draw in their tummy and they push out their chest and they tend to hold their breath. So what you have to do is to get them to breathe. So you have to, before you measure the man, you have to talk to them and get them to say something. And when they start talking to you, all of a sudden the tummy comes out, the shoulders drop off and you've got your man. So that's called a heuristic, a, a, a trick of the trade, something you do to achieve an outcome. Mnemonics are ways in which we can remember things. And so Sinclair um, in, was in medical education and referred to a whole set of, of, of um, acronyms which are used to help doctors remember complex medical considerations. But one thing that Sinclair um, reported is that junior doctors were told rather than trying to remember the conditions of pneumonia as an abstract set of conditions, remember the patient that you first 
encountered it in because you can remember the patient and through remembering the patient, you can recall the, the symptoms the patient had had. And what we know is that when we have rich, um, um, rich indexes, it helps us remember and organize knowledge. It's called indexicality. And that is something that comes from authentic experiences. We remember them. So what was suggested here is that if doctors could remember the condition by the patients they'd first encountered, they would remember that far more effectively than an abstract set of numbers. And then there's a Makovicki here with partially worked examples where bits of lace are left and you can see how they're constructed. Now, here in the handout, you've got these um, strategies set out um, on this document here. So you see there's one there on the, the storytelling, the verbalization, the pedagogy rich activities, um, the, uh, the process of, of guidance, and then the, um, sorry, um, that's the, um, uh, um, that's the learning of, sorry, I don't have any French. That's on the second table of your handout. And that's about partially direct worked examples. Direct instruction. Yep. And then heuristics and then mnemonics um, be below there. So what I've tried to do in this table and is describe the practice, provide a description of it, and then the, the kind of objectives that can be used to achieve, um, you know, to, to, what these strategies are useful for, the kind of knowledge. And you'll also see in your handout that I've indicated on this far column here, the kinds of knowledge which are likely to be generated by the use of these kind of strategies. But let me provide you an example of, of um, a pedagogy rich work activities. Now, this is in response, this is what I was referring to earlier in the response about the question between teach, these are what is referred to as teachable moments. But um, teachable is a bit of a problem, it's about a learning moment. And so some work activities are inherently pedagogically rich. The very qualities of them make them effective learning experiences. So here's some examples. So nurses handovers. So at the end of a shift, nurses, the incoming shift of nurses is often briefed by the outgoing shift of, of nurses about the patients for whom they are caring. And in the ones that I've observed, there are five considerations. The patient, how old they are, do they live on their own? The patient's condition, or quite often conditions, the treatment or treatments they're having, and then how the patient is, is responding to those treatments. And then what is the prognosis? Where will the patient be at the end of the shift or tomorrow or the day after? Now, I'm sure you can appreciate that as they discuss these cases, these are rich learning opportunities. And what happens in these meetings, people put forward opinions and the opinions are discussed and people verbalize that in and, and the contexts are very, very rich. And nurses often are quite voluble. That is, they talk a lot, they have lots to say and novices can follow the experience, can follow the, the, the processes through of considering the patients their progress and prognosis is making a prediction. And that is a higher order cognitive function where you gather evidence and you make a prediction. And the, the important thing about this kind of activity is that a, a novice, I've sat in on these meetings and I can make some sense of what they're, um, what they're talking about and I have no nurse preparation. Um, a more experienced nursing student can understand and, and learn from these experiences. And then a graduate um, nurse can engage in the discussions and, and follow through. So this is an example then of a work activity which occurs every day in hospitals across the world and it has great learning potential. And I guess um, what I'd say here is there's other, others, by the way, there's in healthcare, there's what are called mortality and morbidity meetings um, that are important. But 
one of the key concerns is, uh, sorry, I, I thought I had it in here, is, is how the learners come to engage in these experiences. And a story I've told many times is, I was sitting once watching one of these handovers, and these are meetings which stop and start, and there were two nursing students next to me. And in a halt in the discussions, one of the nursing students, the one of the nursing students leant over to the other and said, let's go. And they left. And I don't think they were going to the library. And it occurred to me that um, they hadn't been prepared to engage in this experience. This was a great experience being afforded them and they didn't have a basis to engage with it. So if those students, for instance, had been told that they had to, they would be caring for patient number four or number five, they would probably engage in it far more effectively. If they were told that there's a particular structure here that they could use, there's a pedagogic device here about these five items, patient, conditions, treatments, response, and prognosis. That is a conceptual schema which if the students have that, they can then use that as a basis to engage in these activities, but also um, understand about how patient care progresses. So here's an example of something which is afforded through everyday work activities. The question is how um, students and or learners come to engage with it. And this is a situation where um, if, if, if there were students were prepared for it, they could probably learn a lot more from it rather than just participating in it passively. Okay, now the, the next thing is this, this idea of personal epistemologies, and this is individuals learning that's shaped by, their, by what they know, what they do, and, and what they value. And um, what they know is that their conceptual knowledge, what they can do is their procedural knowledge, their ability to achieve goals, and their values is the dispositional knowledge. And that's what people um, possess and that's what people bring to these situations and it's how they exercise that which is important in their learning. So here's some personal epistemological practices which are in the third table of the handout. The first one is what is referred to as imitation or mimesis. Now often imitation is seen as being a lower order of learning. It's unthinking learning. But that doesn't appear to be the case, that the actual process of imitating requires higher order considerations of what is going on, how to reproduce that, for what, for what purpose, and how to actually achieve it. So there's these considerations that this process of mimesis, which is probably how people have learned across human history, is probably quite central. So imitation is not just to be seen as being mindless learning. And there's a process referred to as ontogenetic ritualization. And this actually comes from studies of primates and it's how um, two partners learn to negotiate to share things, which include the sharing of knowledge. And this account is often seems to be how people in workplaces come to negotiate and, and engage with each other. And I think that's potentially helpful. And importantly, the concept of apprenticeship is that it's about, apprenticeship is about the active engagement and construction of knowledge. The meaning of the word apprenticeship comes from apprehend, that is to seize the knowledge, to take the knowledge. And um, in contemporary studies, relatively contemporary studies of apprenticeship in the Middle East for um, the building of minarets, Trevor March and has suggested that the apprentices have to steal the knowledge, they have to take the knowledge because the knowledge isn't provided for them. And in that instance, the apprentices, their job, because you, when you build a minaret tower, you know minarets on the mosques, they're built from inside out. And the apprentices bring the stones up to the masons and that allows them to see how the masons um, prepare the, uh, the mortar and, and position the stones. And then later the apprentices are able to do that with the stones inside, and then later on, they go to put the stones on the outside. Um, and what is important is that in that, it's this ruler I was showing you before, 
it would seem that across most of human history, that apprenticeship has been a mode of learning. And it's only in this relatively recent era that apprenticeship has become a model of education. So across many cultures, apprenticeship is an active process of learning, not being taught. So <clears throat> the Japanese word for apprentice is miniari, <clears throat> one who learns by observation. And also they have a term for <clears throat> an obtrusive observation, which is miniari kukui. And that is the person learns not by staring at the expert, but rather observing them without intruding into them, on, on them. And all of this uh, is central, so all of this action is central, brings, sorry, all of this makes central the importance of learner readiness, the learner being interested and willing to engage. And Bun um, refers to in those Kyrgyzstan tribes, which are referred to in the, in the video, that if somebody, if somebody in those nomadic tribes wants to be um, uh, a blacksmith or wants to be a, a maker of yurts, they have to indicate they want to do it. Similarly, <clears throat> a singleton study of pottery making in Japan. Growing up in a house where they make these pots is not sufficient. The young person has to say, I want to learn to be a potter. They have to be interested and they have to in want to engage uh, with it. <clears throat> and finally, the importance of deliberate practice that we don't become good at anything, whether we're talking about playing a musical instrument or sport or the development of fine skills, unless we deliberately practice them. So part of the personal um, epistemological act is a person being willing to deliberately practice to enhance and prove, improve their performance. Now, this in some sense goes back to the um, uh, question that was uh, asked earlier um, of me. And there's a quote here from Bridget Jordan, and she's this anthropologist, I guess, who looked at how um, Mexican, uh, sorry, midwives or birth attendants in Mexicans learned their skills. What she said was, and I quote, whatever the origins of the didactic mode, it's always been a minor mode of knowledge acquisition in our evolutionary history. In the West, however, the didactic mode of teaching and learning has come to prevail in our schools to such an extent it's often taken for granted as the most natural, as it was the most efficacious and efficient way of going about teaching and learning. This view is held despite the many instances in our own culture of learning through observation and imitation. And then going back to Japan and the apprenticeships in there, it's expected that serious learning will proceed unmediated by didactic instruction. Miriagi, Miriani Kiyoyu describes an education which relies upon principles of learning, observation, uh, and refers specifically to apprenticeship education. Yet it is the apprenticeship, uh, it is the apprentice who has to discover even this. And that is, not only does the apprentice have to learn, actively learn, but in some sense, they have to set out to understand how to learn and how to engage in ways which allows them to learn, such as what was found by Trevor Marchand in his studies of apprentices in minaret, in, in minaret apprentices in, in, in the Middle East. So, um, what this emphasizes then is the importance of the apprentice needing to actively engage. Now, one thing I think is a huge contrast between this approach to um, how people learn and the approach that's taken in, in educational institutions. In my educational institution, what I have to do is tell the students exactly what they'll be learning, how they'll be learning it, how they'll be assessed, and the criteria for that assessment. And that's actually the totally opposite of what has occurred in these situations of learning that have uh, arisen across human history. Now, I'm not saying we should turn this all over, but I think it's worthwhile just contrasting the processes and the kind of engagement 
that's been uh, required of learners learning through practice compared with the conventions that exist within educational institutions. So in this um, table three, I've got this elaboration of these um, forms of uh, personal epistemological practices, which you can see here, the mimetic learning, ontogenetic ritualization, no French word for that one. And then there is the um, um, embodied, um, embodied knowledge, um, the importance of deliberate practice. Um, uh, there is guided rediscovery. There's active engagement, observation, um, averting gaze, which I haven't mentioned, and also readiness of the learner and their importance to assent, to want to engage in the practice and learn from it. And just to finish then, so the focus on learners' personal epistemologies seemed to be important. This image here is one that was taken in, um, in Beijing and it was an event um, about HIV AIDS. And these um, nurses have come along to listen to talks about HIV AIDS. And all of the nurses look very similar. Well, not really, but they're in similar outfits, but not really. And they're responding in very different ways to the projection, the lecture about HIV AIDS. And you can imagine the different cultural backgrounds which are represented in these, in, in these, in these nurses and the way that they might respond differently to a lecture on HIV AIDS, both the procedural side of things and also issues associated with morality, et cetera. So hence the importance of um, learners' personal epistemologies. It is they who learn. It is they who decide how to take up the invitations that are afforded them. And I could provide lots of examples there. And it would seem that some of the bases for um, people's engagement is subjectivities, how they see themselves. Do they see themselves as wanting to learn this particular occupation? Do they have the interest to do so? Um, what are their values associated with the content that's being learned? And their intentionalities. And so intentionalities is how we direct um, our cognition, our perception, our action, and also our introspection. And that's something that only we can exercise in terms of, of how we use our cognitive processes and our capacities, what we already know and what we're, our readiness to engage. And then there's also other very human facts such as brute facts of, you know, interpsychological is what's within the self, energy and fatigue. So by the end of yesterday afternoon, you're all very tired, very difficult listening to English, making sense of these concepts. And so at that point, perhaps, you know, your engagement with the content was not um, perhaps um, optimum. And so, for instance, what I found in with um, students in Australia is that many of our students are not time poor. They're actually time jealous. That is, they're very precious about how they use their time and they act accordingly. And that will be referred to in the video you'll see soon. But just to finish, what I'd like to do is to bring together these three ideas of the practice curriculum, practice pedagogies, and personal epistemologies in an example of a third year medical student who we'll call Sue. And she engages in something which is called longitudinal rural placement. And that is, she went to be working with a doctor in a small town in a place that I'll call um, Creekland, Creekland. And Sue was a third year medical student and she'd previously had some experience in a rural community. And she went to this community and she was working alongside a general practitioner. For the first 
six weeks. She sat in the, the surgery with the general practitioner and observed what the general practitioner was doing. The general practitioner also um, asked questions of her, questioned her, gave her jobs to do and sought explanations from her. And after um, six weeks, Susan was given her own consulting room where she would actually do the history taking of patients and the examinations. And then she would, she would be, these would be checked by the doctor and the patient would then be given treatments. And um, Susan wanted to learn how to take bloods from patients. Now, in these small rural communities, the, the, the doctors have visiting rights at the local hospital. And Susan had gone to the local hospital and met people there. And she knew the person who did a lot of taking of bloods. And so she contacted that person and she went to the hospital and spent a day working with different patients, learning how to take bloods from, from adults, from children, and also perhaps um, an, uh, an older adult who might have delirium or dementia. And she then engaged, didn't just do one, but she did many so as to develop her procedural skills to take bloods effectively. And there's something else I'll say about Susan is that she was in this rural community on the Friday, rather than going back to Adelaide, she actually decided to spend the weekends in this community. She joined the local church group and she joined the local tennis club. And then she got to know people in the community and the people got to engage with her and know her. And because she was interacting with many people from the hospital, when an interesting case came up, they contacted her and brought her into the hospital to engage. So here you see the, the three things coming together. Firstly, the practice curriculum, the sequence of experiences that Susan was exposed to, the practice pedagogies of, of being uh, uh, questioning, uh, explanations, and then being given these opportunities to engage in parallel practice. But a lot of this was underpinned by her personal epistemology of being um, engaging with the community, seeking out experiences, and um, learning through um, learner-initiated activities. So that's the way that these three things are brought together in this particular instance. Okay, so I will stop sharing there and hopefully there'll be some questions to um, respond to that. As I said, the material for all of this is in this handout you've got there. And so there's the three tables. The first table is on the learning curriculum, the practice curriculum, which you discussed yesterday. The second table is on the, um, the pedagogic practices. And the third table then is on the personal epistemological practices. And I hope the fact that it's translated into French is helpful for you. So hopefully there's some questions from that. <clears throat> um, I have one question. It's about the table too, about the different pedagogies uh, on the workplace, on the workplace. And you said you wrote the the practice, the description, and the objectives behind uh, the goals behind these pedagogies. And um, I see that for the heuristic one, there's no objective, no goal mentioned. Yeah. That's called incompetence on my part. <laughs> so uh, yes, I, I just didn't do it and I'm sorry, I didn't do it. That's, there's nothing other than it's me not putting the words in there. Um, what you'll see next to it is that um, the PS there is about procedural development, um, about the development of procedural capacities. And generally speaking, heuristics um, are about means of achieving goals. Mm -hmm. And so the, the code in that far right hand column, um, I should have fixed that up. Somebody pointed out to me some time ago and I haven't done it and I apologize. Um, but that really is that it's about the development of procedural capacities. Procedural capacities are those that we use to achieve goals. And the difference between an algorithm 
and a heuristic is an algorithm is something that guarantees you success. Two and two equals six. Um, whereas a, a heuristic often is engaged with a more complicated task. It doesn't guarantee success, but what it is, it gives you a procedure which helps you achieve the goal that you want to achieve. And they're often referred to as tricks of the trade. And this is, uh, this is what, what is used in you know, many occupations. And so these heuristics, the ways of, it, it can't guarantee success, but it helps you get close to it. So yes, apologies for that, that um, missing text on my part. No problem. There's nothing mysterious about it though. <sighs> Any other questions? Maybe I, I just have a clarification question, uh, Stephen. Sure. Um, it's regarding the the personal epistemology, so table three. I wondered if you could give an example of uh, ontogenetic ritualization. I'm not sure I, I understood that. Yeah, okay. Um, it is how two people negotiate to work together essentially. And um, it's often, the, the, the classic example of ontogenetic ritualization actually comes, as I said, from primates. And the one that Tomasella refers to is the baby orangutan wants to get access to its mother's teat. And the baby makes a big fuss and the mother says, go away, go away, you're too noisy. And then the baby has to say, please, please, please. Okay, um, and gets the breast milk. It's what the Americans call making nice. So it's about the way that people actually come to learn how to engage with each other in a constructive way that achieves their outcomes. So that if you can think of the ways in which, for instance, an interprofessional team works in healthcare where you have doctors, you have nurses, you might have physios, um, whatever. And the way that the team comes together, um, it needs to be about respect, it needs to be about inclusion. Um, and these things need to be demonstrated and, and practiced to encourage um, contributions in what is often a very hierarchical work situation. So it's, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's the process of, of uh, people coming to work with each other to achieve goals in ways that um, is respectful of each other, builds up understanding. Uh, at one level, one of the outcomes of this is what is referred to as intersubjectivity, shared understanding. So that um, through working with somebody, you don't have to consciously ask all the time because you know how that person's going to respond, you think. So, for instance, if you've been on a building site, what you'll see is that carpenters that have worked together for a long time. I use this example a lot. Um, if one of them goes and picks up a piece of timber, the other will look across and say, oh, is that too heavy for that person to lift on their own? The, nothing will need to be said. Nothing will need to be said, sorry. Um, they will know that it's a piece of wood that can be lifted by one or the other person needs to come across and help. And then for instance, when carpenters turn the piece of wood, because if you're getting, having a load on something with a piece of wood, you want to set the bow of the wood against the load and nothing will be said, they will turn it and they will agree that that's where the bow is and will put it down. So through working together, um, you develop shared understanding into subjectivity. And this comes through a process, I think of ontogenetic ritualization. Mm -hmm. So um, it's that process. So many years ago, I'm sorry, I was on an ethics committee that was about giving access, as I've mentioned, to dead people, what are called cadavers, mm -hmm. um, of, for scientific access. And we would have very, very complicated meetings, very difficult meetings, 
um, I was the, um, what's called the lay person. I was bringing the perspective of the ordinary Australian to this experience because the scientists wanted to go in there and take all sorts of things from the body. And they would say that's important for science. And then my job was to say, whoa, hang on, you know, you, know, you can't desecrate a dead body. You must be careful about that. Um, so it was in that, in those meetings, there would be a playoff between the need of science to get samples from a dead body. Um, and remember, this is somebody's son or daughter or mother or, or partner. Um, and it was this interaction that understanding that perspective, yes, you needed the sample, but do you really need this much or can you have that much? And so it's that kind of interaction that uh, uh, I think arises from humans coming together to working together, understanding each other's perspective and trying to come up with a workable, a means of, of, of progressing forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. By the way, Tomasello on one of his articles has said that concept can't be applied to humans. And on other, in, in his later work, he has said it can be applied to humans, if, if that's of interest, mm -hmm. because the concept came from primates. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other questions? Fadi? We can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, so I have another question about uh, the guided learning and uh, its application. You said earlier that obviously you're doing the opposite of what you study. I mean, in your university, you don't do what you promote about the guided learning. But at some point, isn't there any limits to this concept of uh, guided learning and apprenticeship in uh, initial school or even in uni, in which place you have to uh, acquire knowledge? Yeah, <clears throat> yes. And I think it's a good question. And this is what the next section's about. And simply put is we have to work out what experiences are best for developing what kinds of knowledge. And rather than assuming that, for instance, all knowledge can be learned in the workplace or all knowledge can be learned in the education institution, we have to say, what experiences are best to develop particular kinds of knowledge? And then, particularly importantly, how can we reconcile the two sets of experiences so that we can draw upon the contributions of the workplace, for instance, and what happens in education institutions? So that it's, there are certain things, as I've said, you can't learn in the workplace, sometimes that hard to learn knowledge, sometimes conceptual knowledge. I mean, learning about physiology, how the human body works, you don't learn that on a hospital ward. Well, he learns aspects of it, but in terms of the theoretical ideas behind it, that's probably best learned in a specialized lecture or instructional process, which helps you understand all of that. So it's a question of, of what kind of experiences we want to organize to achieve, what kind of learning outcomes, where those experiences are and focus on that, rather than assuming that everything can be learned in the workplace or everything can be learned in the education institution. And so the best models, I think, is the combination of the two and drawing upon the experiences that um, you have in both settings and seeking to reconcile them. So what you're saying that this, we shouldn't be looking for one only way to solve this uh, the problem of education, but it's like a combined uh, solution? Yes, yes, very much so. And, and when we look at really successful models of education for, you know, for, for occupations, most of them have a combination of educational provision and practice-based experiences and them brought together. The key question though is what is the sequence of them and how best they can be organized. Now some years ago I visited, well spoke to people in Copenhagen in Denmark and there for the courses in radiography on the Monday the students when they begin their course they turn up to the college in, um, in Copenhagen and they do their induction on day one, you know get their student card on day two, they report to a hospital and they spend the next six weeks in a radiography department at a hospital. They've done no theory. 
they haven't done anything other than get their student card. And that is, the, that is a particular model they use because they want to immerse the students in the radiography department. And um, then once they've had that experience, then they go back to the uh, education institution and learn other aspects of it. Now, that's, I think, is a very unusual approach because most of the approaches is you do what's called theory um, for first. And when you have some possession of theory, then you go in the workplace. Um, there's different models. When I was doing my teacher education, <clears throat> I did it in a way that I would spend um, a period of time at a teacher's college, but a period of time in the same time space teaching a group of students. So I had an integrated teacher education model, a practice-based model of teacher education. So I was actually teaching students right from the beginning of my teacher education program. Um, so there's different models. And it's a question then of what, what's appropriate, um, what kind of experiences we want to generate in, 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 for, both for both settings um, and how we can then integrate those experiences. Yeah, we have a comment in the chat by Christelle who says, uh, I think that academic work will encourage people and countries to be aware of the importance of workplace learning. So the role of universities would also maybe to, to contribute to promote workplace learning as important. Yes, yes, I think that's, I mean, and the thing is that nobody would dream of having a medical education program or a nurse education program without extensive practice experience, but it's not passed on to other areas. Some of that is associated with cost, um, administration, and it's difficult, and it can be very expensive. But in terms of you know, achieving governmental goals about developing employable graduates, um, unless you have those experiences, um, it's gonna be very difficult. My own personal story is that I did my, um, uh, when I left school, I wasn't any good at school, by the way. I failed my, um, I failed, I failed at school. And I did a, a, a vocational education course in tailored garment manufacturing, which was at a very good college, by the way. Um, and I did that for two years and then had just one visit to a factory, a clothing factory, which was a very bad experience. And then um, I went into um, to work in a clothing factory. And the very difficult thing for me was that I achieved the national top marks in the City and Guilds of London Institute. So I went into this workplace as being the most, um, the best student in the nation in 1970, no, beg your pardon, 1969, there you go. Um, and it was a very difficult experience because people in the workplace were expecting some genius who knew how to knew his way around a clothing factory. I'd never been in a clothing factory. And it was a horrible experience because people thought this was funny that I didn't know what I was doing because I hadn't had the work experiences. And it was a very, very difficult personal experience. And that's one reason why I'm so keen on preparing students to, be, um, uh, to, be, um, to move smoothly into the workplace by having the kind of experiences and you'll You'll pick that up in the, in the session on the integration of experiences. I forget the question I was answering, sorry. No, I mean, the, the question, well, I mean, it's not what was, was a comment, not a question, but the, the role of university work. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and yeah. changing also the perceptions of the importance of workplace learning. Yes, yeah. Okay, so are there uh, any other comments or questions on, on Stephen's talk about pedagogic practices and uh, personal epistemologies. Si personne a d'autres questions, moi je peux en lancer une autre. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, so I have a question about uh, personal epistemologies, mm -hmm. um, which is the perception, perception that we have uh, of our intelligence, right? Perception is part of it, yes, yes. Okay, how can we develop the, how can we, sorry, how can we develop this personal epistemology, which is the perception of, of us, I mean, of us as a learner? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, it's it's an accumulate, but it, it exists as a fact. I mean, we, you know, yeah, I, I know, but how, value. But Sorry? how can we uh, empower it? I mean, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, one thing is providing experiences that people have success and being able to see that they exercise that and can achieve outcomes uh, within it. And so giving opportunities, providing opportunities to achieve, um, providing opportunities for people to do things that they're interested in and develop them further, all of, all of, all of those kind of things, yeah. But it is, it is said that scholar, uh, school uh, experience is uh, a source of this personal epistemology. Uh, what sort How of experience? The, the school experience. School experience, yeah, sorry. What if I failed school? How can I build a positive personal epistemologies? Because I cannot redo school, I'm too old. Well, I mean, not all people's experience is premised upon school success. There are lots of people that don't do well. I didn't do well at school. Um, and many of the adults that I work with um, didn't enjoy school and didn't have a linear pathway from school onwards. And there's other people who pride themselves on the fact that they, they weren't successful in school. Um, so personal epistemology is, is, is the, really the knowledge that we have and how we use that knowledge. And we use that knowledge in, in a number of ways. I mean, we, we use it in sport, music, cultural activities, work, uh, how we engage in family and community. They're, they're attributes that we have. And you're right to say that, of course, people who have negative experience in schools often um, um, you know, re feel rejected by it and have very difficult pathways forward. But there's also experience suggests that people who didn't have success at schools later on can have, there's no reason why people who aren't successful at school don't have, you know, rich um, and interesting lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Of course, if, if people, I mean, of course, if people aren't engaged in the way that they don't develop literacy and numeracy skills, um, that's a problem. Now, I actually, when, when I was in school in Britain in the 1950s and 60s, would you believe, um, there was a system called progressive education and it, the idea of progressive education was that people like me would end up working in a factory, which was true. But because I was working in a work in a factory, I didn't need to learn English language. I was taught about English literature. I could recite Wordsworth and some of the other poets, but I wasn't given the skills of English language sentence structure, uh, syntax, etc. And when I went to, for a very circuitous route to higher education, when I was almost 30, I didn't know what a sentence was. My two elder brothers, um, who are two and four years older than me, so my eldest brother is in his 70s, he can't write a sentence. And he, this was not from an impoverished background, this was a middle class family because education at that point in time, progressive education said that people like me, there's no point in preparing you with English um, language skills because you'd never use them. Now, I, I do write the occasional article you'll have noticed. So, um, you know, there's a life beyond school. And that's one reason, for instance, why vocational education uh, and adult education is so important for people who don't negotiate um, schooling effectively. Yeah. Thank maybe, you. Maybe I, I just wanted also to, um, to elaborate on this uh, question by, by Fadi, because I, I also have the impression, uh, but I may be wrong, that um, the status of uh, personal epistemologies is a little bit different in terms of how can we influence and how can we act on that. Uh, if, if we sit now in the position of the, uh, the trainer or the cur curriculum designer or the person that tries to enrich the workplace as, a, as an effective learning environment, I can understand how I can act on the ordering of the curriculum. I can arrange activities, I can 
have an impact on that. I cannot also understand how I can um, uh, enrich uh, the pedagogic practices because I can I, I can develop some specific uh, tasks like uh, thinking about guided learning or, or, or trying to have uh, identify rich learning experiences. But it's very much it's much more difficult to understand how I can act on personal epistemologies because these are, as you say, in the hands of the learner itself. So I think it's a, it's yeah. a it's a bigger challenge for the yes. uh, the trainer to act on this uh, third uh, level. Would you agree on that? Yes. Yes, but I mean, I think of some of the examples from your work, Laurent, mm -hmm. um, of your videos of apprentices, and I'm seeing the one now where you had the electric the guy producing the electrical um, mm -hmm. components in that factory. Now he was treated appallingly mm -hmm. by the people in the workplace from what we saw in the videos. Mm -hmm. So he, that person wasn't given positive feedback in terms of what he'd achieved. Um, they were looking for mistakes and looking for problems and accusing him of being stupid. Um, and it's, it's just about incremental engagement giving people acknowledgement of success of what they've done well, as well as what they haven't, the feedback on what they haven't done well. So, I mean, personal epistemology exists as a fact, is how we make sense of the world. But in terms of actually engaging them productively, it, it, I think it's partly can be facilitated by, um, you know, productive incremental engagement in work activities, which, mm -hmm. which often is the case, it often happens. But of course, having a supportive environment where people are feeling valued um, and people are getting positive feedback as well as negative feedback is likely, I think, to um, um, support that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, some people will actually thrive um, to overcome disadvantage um, and overcome um, um, limitations. And you know, the world is full of women, for instance, who've had to struggle um, and people of color to uh, overcome the limitations. I, ex I experienced one set of limitations, but there's a whole pile of other limitations that people um, uh, struggle against. And this is why there's this contestation between the person and the social world that we live in. How we negotiate that, I mean, people negotiate it in one way and to either drop out of society or to take a particular view or to engage in criminality or to want to prove people wrong. And so you put effort in and achieve outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that interplay. And of course, there's, it's, it's got to be a combination of both the person and the situation and how that plays out in its multiple ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm getting very preachy. <laughs> getting close to Sunday for me, not yeah. for you, but it's very close to Sunday. Okay, do you have uh, any other questions or comments on Stephen's talk? Okay. So if you still have to say something to Stephen, you better hurry up because otherwise yeah. he will have his, um, his uh, Saturday evening drink or meal. <laughs> um, just a couple of things. I, I want to answer Pauline on something. I didn't think I answered her question very well. I will write something to that. Um, to which question tomorrow. was it? Uh, the one that Pauline asked earlier about the... Um, 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 oh, if, it's the, sorry, that, it was the one about... Some people who don't think a hard, hard task is hard. Yeah. But, yeah, yes. Something so I just felt I didn't answer that question very well. Um, okay. I'm not sure I've answered any of the questions well, I should say, but that one in particular. So um, I, I will, I'll, I'll try and come back to um, uh, think of that. And if Pauline can articulate to me the exact question, I will, I, I will attempt to address that. Yeah. Okay, anyway, just thank you very much for your engagement. I realize this is quite difficult. Um, you're all sitting there. I'm speaking in English far too quickly, using technical terms, telling long stories. And I appreciate it's very difficult for you to make sense of it. Um, but I, I do appreciate the questions you've asked. And I hope that um, some of the ideas I've raised um, are helpful for you in your studies, but also, importantly, in your, mm. your work. 
So um, I, I wish you well. I think this is where I depart. Is that correct, Laurent? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, um, just uh, just uh, wait a minute before you you leave. I, I right, also okay. wanted to to thank you, thank you very much for all your your work and also your generosity in terms of time and also the the design of the whole activities and everything is uh, has been made by you for the students. So I think it's uh, it was very um, I mean important and rich. And uh, I don't know if anybody wants to say something just before you you leave. Maybe I would like to say something. Yes, uh, I would like to say thank you for your intervention uh, of yesterday and today. Uh, we feel that we had in front of us uh, someone uh, uh, very um, specialist in his uh, own domain. So uh, we can learn a lot of things uh, with, uh, with the concept you present to us. Thank you so much. I didn't know that um, uh, it, for myself, it permits me to um, um, put myself uh, in the place of the apprentice and ask questions about the situation. So thank you so much, mm -hmm. Professor. Yeah. yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for your kind comments. Thank you, yeah. And uh, please remember the, the reason I find it so interesting to do this and put energy into it is this is my vocation. And that's the difference between having an occupation and having an occupation, which is your vocation. And that's, that's a, this is, a, I'm very lucky to have something which I, I feel important to me and uh, I can make contribution to others. So that's the difference between having an occupation and a, voca and a vocation. And um, um, yeah. yeah, that's why I'm here on Saturday it. night. <laughs> we can feel it. That's the way we feel. Oh, I, I feel that you are passionate about what you're doing. So, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we can feel it. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Sarah, for that, uh, that kind comment. Yeah. All right. Anyway, I, I wish you well for the rest of your course. Oh, and I, I believe it's snowing there. It was 34 here today. So um, very different, very different um, climates. And I do hope, fingers crossed, that the virus um, reduces and is under control before too long. So I wish you all well and keep well and keep safe. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. All of the best. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bah, merci. Uh, merci beaucoup pour uh, votre. Uh, votre attention et votre participation. Euh, c'est vrai qu'on a eu une, une matinée bien, bien remplie et, et bien intense. Euh, c'est vrai qu'on n'a pas fait de deuxième pause comme c'était prévu, donc on ne va pas non plus euh, prolonger euh, au-delà. Je voulais peut-être juste avant de, de clore cette matinée, vous, euh, vous présenter l'activité qui va nous intéresser cet après-midi. Vous allez voir qu'elle est, euh, est assez simple. Euh, et puis vous devriez normalement pouvoir vous y, euh, vous y retrouver donc au fait euh, on va se retrouver à, à 13h30 et on va, euh, on va regagner les, les mêmes cinq sous-groupes que euh, hier et donc vous aurez l'occasion d'enrichir de, un peu vos réflexions sur vos situations de référence à partir de ce que Stephen Villette a, a présenté euh, ce, ce matin et donc, euh, aussi en vous référant à la, à la fameuse brochure dont vous avez la version PDF de cette brochure dans le, sur Moodle, donc euh, en vous référant au, au tableau 2 et 3, euh, ce qu'on va vous demander, c'est d'identifier de, en tout cas trois euh, pratiques pédagogiques. Donc, enfin, vous allez devoir examiner un peu vos situations sous l'angle de ces deux stratégies pour augmenter en quelque sorte le potentiel d'apprentissage de vos situations de, de travail. D'abord, sous l'angle des pratiques pédagogiques, donc parmi les différentes activités pédagogiques qu'il a énoncées et que vous retrouverez dans, dans cette brochure, lesquelles pourraient être appliquées à vos situations de référence, c'est-à-dire à la fois lesquelles peut-être ont déjà été appliquées, vous les avez peut-être déjà rencontrées dans vos situations, mais peut-être aussi lesquelles pourraient être ou auraient pu être implémentées pour essayer de soutenir les, les apprentissages en lien avec cette situation. Et puis, la même chose sur le registre des pratiques épistémiques. Donc, euh, euh, toujours en vous référant à votre situation de référence, 
quelles pourraient être les, euh, les stratégies pour, pour euh, augmenter en quelque sorte le potentiel d'apprentissage sous l'angle des pratiques épistémiques. Et donc là aussi, aussi bien les pratiques épistémiques que vous avez rencontrées ou qui existent déjà, mais peut-être aussi celles qui n'existent pas encore et qu'on pourrait imaginer euh, mettre en place ou en tout cas euh, euh, renforcer dans, dans ces situations de travail. Donc voilà, vous pouvez déjà réfléchir un peu à ça individuellement, mais vous aurez le temps euh, cet après-midi en sous-groupe de revenir sur vos situations à travers ces, ces deux instruments qui complètent la question du curriculum qu'on a, qu a vu hier. OK Des questions par rapport à ce qu'on a fait ce matin Ça va, c'est tout clair moi, j'ai une question de, de précision, mais je pense que je peux, je peux juste vous la poser à vous, puis laisser les gens aller manger. Bah, Posez-la toujours, on ne sait jamais. Ça. En général, on part du principe que si quelqu'un a une question, elle concerne en tout cas 30% des, des étudiants. Donc, posez-la. Euh, alors, c'était pour savoir, en fait, pourquoi est-ce qu'on n'a pas d'outils de, de, de développement de l'épistémologie personnelle, alors qu'on a des outils de développement du sentiment d'efficacité personnelle bon, Après... Bon, c'est la, la réponse qu'il a faite aussi à ma question, c'est qu'on on peut, euh, enfin, quand on dit qu'on n'a pas de, on n'a pas d'outils de développement des épistémologies personnelles, je pense qu'il enfin, ne serait pas forcément d'accord avec ça. On, on pense qu'on peut agir sur les épistémologies personnelles, mais peut-être de, de manière indirecte. Par exemple, euh, c'est vrai qu'en étant peut-être plus plus sensible à la position de l'apprenant ou à ses propres manières d'apprendre ou à, sa, à ses propres capacités, euh, on peut aussi euh, enfin, contribuer à, au renforcement de ces épistémologies personnelles. Donc, je pense que la prémisse qui, qui dirait qu'on ne peut pas agir là-dessus, elle peut être aussi euh, contestée. Je pense que le, le, quand on est dans une perspective de workplace learning, on doit considérer qu'on peut créer les conditions qui permettent le développement des épistémologies personnelles. D'accord, ok. Merci beaucoup. En tout cas, c'était le, le sens un peu de sa, de sa réponse. Mais je pense qu'en effet, on n'agit pas sur les épistémologies personnelles comme on agit sur les pédagogies de la pratique ou comme on, on agit sur le curriculum. Euh, on agit peut-être de manière plus indirecte euh, et pas euh, avec les, les, les outils peut-être plus visibles du, euh, du formateur. Oui. Mais bon, après, c'est une question de, de débat que vous pourrez aussi avoir dans, dans les groupes. Merci beaucoup. OK, ça va, vous tenez le coup Très bien. OK, alors je, on, va, on va clore ici. Euh, vous pouvez soit rester euh, connecté, soit vous reconnecter après. Moi, je vais laisser la session euh, ouverte. Et on se retrouve à 13h30 pour euh, la session d'après-midi. OK D'accord, merci. Alors, bon, bon, bon appétit. Bon appétit, merci. merci. Bon appétit. Merci. OK, donc... Bonjour à tous, merci pour votre ponctualité. J'espère que vous avez pu profiter quand même de cette, de cette pause et donc que vous avez encore un peu d'énergie pour cette dernière ligne droite. Donc on va, comme hier, travailler beaucoup plus dans une logique d'atelier, de, de sous-groupe l'après-midi que le matin. Donc on était beaucoup en, en plénière et sur des des discussions générales et des, euh, et des contenus. Euh, donc, vous aurez l'occasion cet après-midi à la fois de, de reprendre vos, euh, vos petites vignettes ou situations euh, personnelles pour les enrichir un peu des, des contenus qu'on a vus ce matin et qu'on va voir cet après-midi. Et puis, on abordera aussi en, en deuxième et dernière partie d'après-midi euh, la problématique de l'intégration. Donc, euh, on va revenir sur les conceptions plus d'ingénierie. De la, de la formation et comment est-ce qu'on peut articuler les, les expériences de travail dans des programmes de formation. Ok, alors comme je vous l'avais dit tout à l'heure, avant la pause de midi, on va commencer cet après-midi par un, un travail de groupe. Donc, je vais vous redistribuer dans les cinq groupes d'hier. On va se donner 45 minutes pour l'activité numéro 3. Donc, vous avez la consigne sur votre fiche d'activité. Et donc, ce qui vous est demandé, c'est vraiment d'identifier par rapport à vos situations de référence trois pratiques pédagogiques et trois pratiques épistémiques qui pourraient s'appliquer, enfin, qui peuvent s'appliquer déjà, ou bien qui pourraient être 
implémenter ou développer pour essayer de, de soutenir les apprentissages en, en situation de, de travail. Donc, on va, vous, on va vous donner 45 minutes, on va, on va se retrouver à 14h15. On vous demande aussi, comme on l'a fait hier, d'identifier un, un porte-parole, parce qu'on aura ensuite un moment de restitution euh, en grand groupe. Donc, peut-être chaque groupe pourra euh, restituer une synthèse de vos observations, euh, sans forcément être exhaustif, mais peut-être de voir quelles, sont, quelles ont été les discussions qui ont animé les groupes et les, les propositions qui, qui ont émergé de vos, de vos présentations. Et puis, ceci nous amènera donc euh, tranquillement vers la, la, le milieu de, de l'après-midi. Alors, n'oubliez pas aussi, de, comme je vous le disais, de, de bien vous référer à ce, à ce document. Donc, Steven Billette a passé assez vite sur la présentation de certaines de ses pratiques pédagogiques et pratiques épistémiques. Euh, elles sont aussi explicitées dans le document écrit. C'est possible qu'elles ne soient pas totalement transparentes. Donc, vous pouvez aussi voir le travail de groupe comme un espace pour essayer de, de croiser vos compréhensions. On passera aussi avec Aïla dans les groupes pour essayer de répondre à vos questions. Mais donc, vous pouvez aussi euh, vraiment vous, vous référer à ce tableau 2 et 3 qui, qui va structurer un peu le, le travail. OK. Est-ce que vous avez des, des questions par rapport à, à l'activité euh, Moi Pardon, oui, c'est moi. Euh, bonjour, je, enfin rebonjour. Désolée, mais c'est pas par rapport à l'activité vraiment. C'est, j'arrive pas à télécharger le dossier. Télécharger le dossier. Quand vous dites le dossier, c'est c'est euh, les brochures. Euh, J'avais une question. C'est en PDF, c'est pour ça ou bien euh, Oui, mais normalement, il devrait pas y avoir de problème. Est-ce que d'autres ont eu le, le problème en téléchargement pas. Pardon moi, j'ai eu le problème. Mais en fait, si tu lui mets juste l'extension .pdf, tu peux l'ouvrir avec n'importe quel, euh, quel programme qui t'ouvre un PDF. D'accord. Mais moi, j'ai effectivement, il a fallu que je les renomme, en fait, simplement que je leur mette l'extension parce qu'elle n'apparaissait pas puis ils ne savaient pas avec quoi les ouvrir. Ben voilà, c'est ça. Tu peux les ouvrir. Ça qui, et ils me demandent avec quel programme avec, ouvrir, bah, ouvrir, euh... Tu peux ouvrir avec Acrobat ou avec n'importe quel. Alors, euh, euh, moi, j'ai essayé avec Word et j'ai que des petits… Euh... Non, avec Acrobat parce que Word, ça ouvre pas les PDF. Oui, c'est okay. un PDF. Voilà, en fait. Oui, c'est un PDF. En fait. D'accord, ouais, c'est gentil. Alors, c'est bon. Merci okay. beaucoup. Donc, c'était la version française que vous avez essayé ouais. <rire> Oui, je ne vais pas aller. Enfin, la ça version ça anglaise, c'est bon. Ah okay. ben, c'est… Non, pas moi. Ok, alors si ça se okay. ouais, alors donc euh, mettez bien PDF à la fin comme extension. Ouais. C'est vrai que c'est un document PDF, c'est pas un document Word. Ok, merci beaucoup hein, okay. tous les deux. Très bien, donc euh, vous êtes prêts pour le travail de groupe ou autre question D'accord. Alors ce que je vais faire, c'est que je vais activer l'ouverture des salles. Normalement, c'est les mêmes distributions que hier. Ah, je vois qu'il y a encore quelques personnes qui sont arrivées. Donc, dans le groupe 4, il y a Léa, Sarah, et puis Constance, elle était dans le groupe 2. Euh... Voilà, normalement, maintenant, vous êtes bien distribués. J'ouvre les salles et puis je vous laisserai les, les valider pour le début du travail. OK alors, on se retrouve à 14h15. Bon travail à vous. Sarah et Fadi, il vous faut accepter vos, euh, vos salles. Fadi, vous nous entendez Fadi On ne peut pas hein, forcer une personne à aller dans la salle, il faut qu'elle accepte. Bon, euh, on va y aller comme ça, on verra quand, 
quand Fadi se, se manifeste. Voilà, donc Aya, je te disais, euh, une des questions qu'on risque d'avoir, c'est des, des questions un peu de... Je t'entends pas. 